Welcome to the Knights of Last Call. My name is uh, Derek Melinda, joining you this evening on a beautiful, beautiful late uh, late spring evening. It is uh, it is quite lovely outside, I must say, and uh, it's a very beautiful day here in Northeast Ohio. Hopefully, everyone is doing well out there. Hopefully, you're excited for tonight's stream. We're uh, doing a little night school now. We don't have Bob present. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, you we can uh, you can stand in for Bob, and uh, we can uh, ask questions and get there get our answers that we need uh, from you all. So, uh, quick shout out by the way, we just had a couple of uh, of updates. Hey, Jason B is in here and already Jason dropping B tips. Ten dollars. I don't like the sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating. Not like you. You're soft and smooth. Who does like sand? Absolutely no one. Uh, thank you, Jake. Jay- thank you, Jason B. Um, <laughs> sand, sand. I'm very smooth. Um, yeah, no, no, Bob, unsubscribe. Uh, thank you, for Frosty. Uh, quick shout out to uh, self confessed cynic GM Scott and William Brandis, who all just renewed for their 14 month streak a couple days ago here on uh, the Nice Last Call YouTube adventure. Uh, and shout out to Shadram, who just renewed for seven months. So, seven month streak for Shadram. So, um, Thank you to all of our supporters. Thank you to our patrons for uh, joining us and being part of this community and uh, excited to have you all here. So uh, we got a couple of things that I wanted to kind of go over first, but um, tonight, uh, before we get into that, uh, but uh, we, we, we will get into that, but tonight we are going to talk about, kind of, kind of talk about campaign creation, but specifically talk about what what are some what are some of the processes and tools and techniques that I am not only not only have I used, but also that I have sort of synthesized over the years from a wide variety of different sources from from Dungeons and Dragons to Dungeon World? Um, how do all of these games sort of you know meld together in my mind to create what is affectionately called a sandbox? And we'll talk, uh, we'll spend at least five or 10 minutes sort of talking about what that means, what does sandbox mean? And more importantly, um, you know, does that, uh, does that term uh, have any sort of baggage with it? And what does a sandbox 
mean and what does it not mean? So we'll talk about definitions first. Um, and then we'll just get into some, I think, some some practical advice uh, that hopefully will help you sort of, uh, you know, uh, make your make your decision about uh, whether or not you want to run your next campaign uh, in a sandbox. And uh, to be clear, uh, we will probably be focusing mostly on fantasy, uh, although I do think that um, most of these techniques are, you know, very applicable to, you know, any sort of um, uh any sort of campaign. Um, there we go. I'm going to turn that light on. Uh, Damian Williams with a uh, super chat uh, says, uh, Sandbox. Bah! What about my BBEG and my story? And, uh, you know, Damian, we'll, we'll, we'll actually get into that a little bit. We'll talk about why and how uh, those two things can actually work. You know what? Those things can actually work together um, in, in, in a certain sense. If you're willing to if you're willing to do the work and you're willing to be open to ideas, you can actually kind of, kind of do that uh, without actually doing it. <laughs> you can have your BBEG, you can have your story, um, but you'll do it in a way that is infinitely better than anything that you could have ever done on your own. Um, and yes, I should note, Tonight is not about building sandboxes for your kids. Um, my advice would be to just get some two by fours, probably some sort of uh, uh, tarp on the bottom, probably with some holes in it for drainage, maybe put it over a bed of gravel or rocks so that you can improve the drainage and then keep a cover on it so that the cats and the local wildlife don't use it as a, uh, as a litter box. Um, yes, you can have your BBEG and eat it too. Yes, Ben. Um, so speaking of Ben, who is here, before we go ahead and get started, uh, I do want to sort of, uh, announce for the wider audience. Um, we had a pretty cool giveaway and, you know, this is again, just sort of a, uh, the kind of thing that happens in the Knights of Last Call community. Uh, now, uh, people in a Patreon who are, you know, close to this, uh, already know, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the outcome of this, but what was pretty cool is Ben A, who is a member of our community, um, came in to Nice the Last Call uh, playing Pathfinder 2 and getting ready to run a campaign in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, started down that path, uh, kind of lost interest in the system, started exploring a million other systems. Ben has limited self shelf space, uh, he lives in New York City, and you know, Pathfinder 2 is not a small game. So Ben uh, decided that he was going to give away his Pathfinder 2 hardcover book collection, which you can see here on screen. Not a small amount of books. Um, and he was going to give it away to a patron, uh, a fellow patron of his. Uh, in other words, one of the members of Nice Last Call. Uh, and so Ben asked everybody to sort of uh, submit a... Uh, <laughs> submit a, uh, a, a a series of uh, a, a sort of submit an essay about um, about ro role playing games, and based on that, uh, Ben chose twenty people who got randomly selected for uh, winning or or the chance at winning Ben's entire Pathfinder Two collection. And uh, I think I I think I included it here. All right, here we go. So there were twenty people overall, uh, all patrons of the Knights of Last Call. Uh, Patreon, and um, the winner was Mike T. So Mike T, uh, who uh, is a relatively, you know, has only come into the Patreon in the last um, <laughs> in the last couple of months. Um, Mike uh, won the prize and is going to be receiving a incredibly long list of uh, of. Of, of, of hardcover Pathfinder 2 books, most of them probably uh, fairly unused. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, you know, thanks, uh, you know, thanks, Ben, for doing that and giveaway. Again, you know, I, I had nothing to do with it. Um, and I, I told Ben if he needed any help or, uh, you know, with uh, with running anything or setting anything up or with the postage or shipping, you know, let me know and Knights will cover that. But obviously, um, you know, Ben is is passing it on. So, Thank you to Ben. Congrats to Mike for winning. Um, it's a it's a hell of a prize. Um, pretty much, 
I mean, not only is it an entire adventure path, but pretty much it's the first you know two years or so of Pathfinder 2. So um, just an incredible, um, just an incredible uh, gift. And uh, yeah, and of course, if you notice there at the end, the Pony Finder is the real is the real prize. Um, exactly, Gossamer. Um, you know, it, it really is a community, and uh, and that is what we really uh, you know it's what I certainly really appreciate about uh, the nice last call. Um, yeah, no, no, no death, no, no pitting people to the death. Instead, it was, you know, a heartfelt, um, you know, asking people about their experiences with role playing games and, you know, getting a chance to know your community members better. And again, uh, it was a very, 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 you know, generous offer. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy that someone like Mike won. So, I mean, everybody on that list would have been a great winner, but, um, you know, uh, Mike's a really good, really good guy. So. Congrats to Mike. Thank you to Ben. And let's start talking about hitting that like and subscribe button, uh, because if you haven't done so already, uh, you know you want to see more of this content. Although at this point, we have a fairly selective audience. I'm pretty sure most of you are are already mem uh, subscribers to the channel. Um, <laughs> that's true. Uh, not that long ago, uh, Damien <laughs> did give away an extra copy of the hardcover of Old School Essential Essentials. We've given away Fate books. Um, we've given away Old School Essentials. We've given away, gosh, we've given away uh, just so many things. So uh, that is a good point. <laughs> you might just randomly get some some sick prizes. Um, so sandbox. Uh, let's talk definitions. So for me, what I mean when I say a sandbox and what I mean by a sandbox campaign is basically the complete opposite of an adventure path or maybe even worse than an adventure path, sort of a, a I mean, adventure paths are pretty pre-written and pre-scripted, a, you know, GM's sort of story where they have established that these are going to be the story beats. This event is going to happen and the PCs are going to stop it. Then this event is going to happen, but the PCs won't be able to stop it in time, which will mean that we go to this really dramatic moment where the PCs will have to rush in and at the last minute, they will save the day. That, which is pretty much what an adventure path is, is sort of one side of the way that you can run a campaign. The other way to run a campaign is what is traditionally called a sandbox. And to me, a sandbox is, and the, re and the reason we call it a sandbox is because by and large of itself, the sandbox does not have any shape. It does not have any form. It does not have any um, structure. Okay, it's just blank sand, but it is a canvas that you can use to build and explore. And most importantly, the sandbox is for the child to build their own stuff and to explore their own ideas. And in doing so, they create this really, really rich and enriched environment where they can explore and, you know, uh, be entertained and be challenged um, and build something that's kind of uniquely theirs while at the same time, not feeling constrained by, uh, you know, the pressures of having to do, to play the game a certain way. So, and, and to a certain extent too, the other thing about a sandbox is, you know, sandbox isn't a sandbox, isn't a beach, right? A sandbox has defined boundaries. You know, it, it, it isn't an infinite expanse of sand. It's, designed to fit in a certain area and it has you know you have you have some tools maybe a little shovel a little pail right it, it you have the equipment that you need in order to be able to have fun in the sandbox um and so that style of play is kind of where or how the hobby originally started back in the 70s the idea was that the gm or the dungeon master would create um, these sort of sandbox environments, these dungeons where, yeah, there was structure, there were there were walls and there was monsters and there were traps, 
But what you did in that dungeon and when you had to do it and if you had to do it, those were all completely led uh, up, led up to the players. And eventually the campaign sort of grew outside of the dungeon and people started doing bigger things. And we kind of got caught up in this idea of these, of these stories, of these movies, because, you know, a movie or a novel is written by an author or a screenwriter and they can, you know, they, they have complete control over the game or uh, over the story or over the evolving narrative, right? They, their job is to take you the passive audience on the journey with these characters and tell you the story that they want to tell you. And people started applying that concept to role-playing games. And I, I don't think that it was a good move. Obviously it was popular because I think people wanted to have these storybook like adventures, um, you know, from the movies or from their favorite novels. But the problem with that is, um, you know, role-playing games have a lot of inherent flaws in them when you're trying to do that. Mostly, which is we're using random dice and random dice have a way to be, you know, random and produce outcomes that are unexpected. And as a result of that, for the last 20 or so years, game designers and play groups have been sort of ice skating uphill, trying to figure out a way to keep random dice rolls and random mechanics in their games, but somehow make them also like these tightly on rails stories. And, you know, we've done everything from creating, uh, uh, you know, really tight math and that no matter kind of what you roll on the, you still get to roll the dice, but it almost doesn't matter because there's a million different ways that you can kind of, you know, jury rig it so that your character succeeds. Or, you know, DMs will just fudge um, and they will say, well, this monster needs to die at this moment. That's what the story it, it requires or or that's what the adventure requires. Um, and so, you know, we need to we need to I need to cheat because I, I have to have this story beat proceed forward. So I think that um, that style of play became popular for two reasons. One, because it's easy. OK, um, and, you know, easy in the sense that it's kind of all figured out for you. You don't have to do any thinking or hard work or heavy lifting. The only thing you have to do is just follow the dotted line and connect the dots. And if you do that, the players will be taken along on the story, just like watching a movie, just like reading a novel. You don't really have to do anything except, I don't know, pay, stay awake. Um, whereas. Uh, so that's like the first thing is really easy to run and to manage. Secondly, uh, a lot of people feel like, hey, like, you know, I, I'm not a good storyteller. My group isn't good storytellers. Oh, Gossamer Chains. Gossamer Change, welcome to Adventurer. You just became a sponsor. Welcome, Gossamer Chains. Thank you so much for the sponsorship. Appreciate it. Enjoy the uh, enjoy the loyalty badge and enjoy the cool Knights of Last Call emojis. Um, thank you so much for doing that. That's really awesome of you. Thank you. Appreciate the support. Uh, you are very strong. Guardian of the Rune says, what do you call a world full of major events that will happen unless PCs do something to get involved, but minus their input will happen? Uh, Guardian of the Rune, I call that a sandbox game because, and, and this is kind of what we're going to get into here, but a sandbox game does not necessarily, it, it should not mean, and it doesn't have to mean that the PCs are the only moving force or driving element in the game because you as a dungeon master, or you as the game master are there to portray a living, exciting and dangerous world. So let's, um, Let's head over to, let's head over to the whiteboard. Um, oh, what the heck is this? I don't even know what that is. Um, so we, I had the, we had the dark mode going on today here. Um, <laughs> so the, uh, let me change this color over. There we go. Um, 
So what I was saying is that um, when you create a sandbox, you are a trying to um, create an environment that the PCs can take proactive action in. But at the same time, you also want to create an environment which is responsive and sort of reacts to the group. And we're going to talk about my personal kind of favorite way to do that um, later on tonight. Um, so let's, well, let's, let's first things first, let's kind of start at the beginning. And I have some notes here that I took um, because I want to talk about just this idea of just, you know, of just kind of, of creating a, a world in, in a general sense. All right. Um, and I've said this before on the stream. I've said this before on night school, which I've told, uh, which I've told Bob, which is remember always the first rule of, of dungeon mastering of game mastering, which is never force yourself to yourself to create more than you must. Um, trying to over plan or overdo everything and come up with every eventuality has been the downfall of more campaigns than probably anything. So we have to remember that when we're going through this process, we, we really don't need to necessarily think of uh, you know every answer. In fact, Dungeon World teaches us that we should draw maps but leave blanks and you know how many blanks you leave and the nature of how you leave those blanks we, we could probably talk about later on i know there are some people who prefer to almost essentially have a completely blank map um and sort of let things kind of resolve randomly or or through random tables but i don't necessarily think that you it, it's a it's a bad thing if you have some ideas about what you want to see happen. You see, part of part of the fun for me as a dungeon master when I create a world, or when I create an adventure, or when I create an encounter, is I am asking a question. Okay, all of these things, a campaign, a world, an adventure, an encounter. That is me, Derek, that's the dungeon master, asking a question. But here's the key, here's the key, de you know, here's like, like it's not a rhetorical question. See, the problem is a lot of adventures and campaigns and adventures and adventure paths and encounters are asking a rhetorical question. By rhetorical question, I mean the person is asking the question for dramatic effect because they already know the answer. A real question, a true question is one in which I am genuinely curious. I am genuinely excited to find out what the answer is. And I don't know. And a lot of times when I am building a campaign or a world or an encounter, it's really just me as Derek being curious about what the PCs will do and get to kind of uh, be entertained by them showing me what they got. So you know, even let's say like at an encounter level, right? Huh. I wonder what would happen if I threw a encounter at the party with only flying creatures. You know, they're level, the party's level five or six or seven. Um, that's probably something reasonable for them. I wonder how they'll handle that. Now, I don't know. I don't have a defined answer. I don't know how they're going to answer it. I, Derek, the GM of my, you know, Pathfinder 2 game, am curious how my group would handle an encounter with all sorts of flying creatures. Or, you know what, I really wanna create an encounter where there's a lot of pits, maybe of acid, and their party, maybe they have to fly or jump around, or there's some tumble checks. I wonder how they would adapt to that scenario. Ooh, what about an encounter 
where all the lights went out or there was a darkness effect? How would the group ch be challenged by that encounter? I'm curious. I, the dungeon master, want to see what they come up with, how they solve this, this issue. I don't have an exact answer in mind, but I'm curious to see what they do. And the same thing, and this is where, you know, a lot of people, I think, understand that. But when you start talking about it from an adventure or you start talking about it, about a campaign, okay, or a world, that's where it becomes a little strange because in an adventure, we understand, oh, right, I'm going to ask them a question. Can they stop, you know, and I'll, I'll use Rise of the Rune Lords because it's fairly well known and fairly well spoiled at this point. You know, if we look at, uh, if we look at uh, Adventure 1 of Rise of the Rune Lords, which is uh, Burnt Offerings is the name of the adventure. The question is, you know, can the PCs stop Nualia and, you know, save Sandpoint? But the truth of the matter is, and you know this and I know this, and the game system sure as shit knows this, that that answer is rhetorical. Of course they're gonna stop Nualia. Hell, if they don't stop Nualia, then the campaign doesn't happen, right? If Sandpoint is destroyed, the campaign doesn't happen, right? So there's a lot of, it, it, it's a rhetorical question. I'm gonna close my door, my dog is barking. All right, we're back. Um, so you can have this idea of an adventure where you really mean, you really are asking this question. Can the PCs stop Nualia? And what happened, you know, and, and be legitimately like, I don't have an outcome in mind. I am going to create a series of challenges or encounters that will test the party and we will find out what happens together. Now take that concept and abstract it again up to an entire campaign. And now you start to understand what a sandbox is. Because again, using Rise of the Rune Lords as an example, the question for the entire campaign is, can they stop the Rise of the Rune, which is a horrible title, by the way, because there's not multiple Rune Lords rising, it's only one. Can they stop Karzug? from returning. That's the campaign, right? And and leading his con the giant army conquest across Varicia and that's the campaign question. And the answer is kind of rhetorical because yes, yes they will. And they have to and they must and they have, you know, and they and not only do you need to make sure that they win so that, you know, you can actually play the second adventure and the third adventure and the fourth adventure and the fifth adventure and the sixth adventure. But also the game system that you're probably playing is fundamentally designed to pr promote players' victory so that we never get stuck in this odd situation where, you know, the party might lose or the party might have to, uh, you know, not win. Um, and so taking a step back from that, the idea of a sandbox is one in which the outcome of Karzug rising is not is not a, a is not a given thing. Karzug might be out there and he has a plan and there are things that Karzug is going to try to do accomplish. But the PCs might stop that or they might fail. And the campaign continues on regardless of that. And this is something we've talked about at length about, you know, the, on this, on this uh, show. But, you know, the idea is you can play a, a RPG and not know what the outcomes are. And if you just take your hands off the wheel and be willing to sort of let things, you know, fall as they may, then the, those outcomes are going to be surprising to you as the game master, which is going to make it a lot more fun. But it's also going to be fundamentally, I, your players are going to have more buy-in because they are going to understand, hey, what we're doing here is actually making a difference. And 
what we do is what is shaped, or what we don't do, what we fail to do, is what is shaping the outcome of this campaign. Because again, to be clear, um, a you know a sandbox type game is still going to be filled with consequences. It's still going to be filled with uh, problems and challenges. But there is a there is a downside. There's a problem to this, and this kind of links us back to our first rule of dungeon mastery, which is never force yourself to create more than you must. When, if I have an adventure uh, path, okay, that I'm writing, and I've got, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six adventures, all the way to level twenty, and you know, I don't know what these are exactly. I'm just making these up roughly here. Okay, these are like the levels you are at the end of each of those adventures, right? Um, the problem is, you know the game expects that by the time we get here, uh, certain key things have happened or haven't happened. And, you know, you paid money and you invested time into reading all this. And also maybe the reason why you were playing an adventure path to begin with is because, you know, you're lazy or you're bad at this or you don't have the time or you don't have the inclination to want to make any of this stuff up, right? So there's a problem is like, if in order for the sixth adventure to even make sense, the party has to do something here in, in adventure number two, they must prevent something from happening in adventure three, they have to succeed at adventure four. Now you're, now you have a, a, a perverse incentive. As a game master, you know that if in adventure three, something you know i don't know let's say the party you know doesn't stop the giants and instead they blow up the volcano um and don't save the town right uh that is going to create not only a problem for the you know immediate future but it also creates a spiraling effect that goes all the way down the rest of these adventure paths because this adventure here assumes that the events of adventure five happened out and played out in an exact way and adventure four or five presumes that Adventure 4 played out in an exact same way. And so because we're never forcing ourselves to create more than we must, when you are playing a sandbox campaign, you never want to be more than a step or two ahead of where the PCs are. In some cases, you might literally be zero steps ahead of them and you might be randomly rolling what happens next as you're playing the game. So whereas in an adventure path, we think of the party starts here and then they go to this adventure and then they go to this adventure and then they go to this adventure. Now, if you had a whole infinite time on your hand, I suppose you could do all this. But what I'm telling you is when they get to the second adventure here, oops, they did something different. And now they're down here and all this work that you did is kind of wasted. Maybe you can reuse some of it, but if you just force the PCs to go back into this path, then what you're really saying is what they did didn't matter. So I recommend just not building out that far in advance. You know, build your first adventure or your first session and have an idea of what those challenges would be but don't necessarily have an outcome in mind. And then when the group goes down this way, you can now start thinking, okay, well, there's a couple different possibilities. They could, they could go this way, they could go this way. Okay, I'll plan this and this. And you know, there's a, maybe an off chance that they do this. So I'll half plan this. Okay, great. And now if the party does end up going, let's say this way, uh, I haven't thrown away months and months of advice or months and months of, of prep. And I haven't thrown away like hundreds of dollars of adventures because now the party is moving into the next thing. And more importantly, when I create the next set of challenges or the next set of adventures or the next set of encounters, I'm doing so with knowledge of everything that has happened before. You see this pre-written adventure over here, adventure number six, it only knows one version of the truth. 
The only version of the truth that this Adventure 6 knows is the one that the authors wrote for as the ideal preferred outcome of Adventures 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And so when they write 6, they have to write it assuming that 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 went off exactly as expected without any hitches. Whereas when you are creating, you know, your let's say this was Adventure 1 and this was Adventure 2 and this was Adventure 3. And now when you are creating Adventure 4, your fourth adventure will feel incredibly deep and extremely well-crafted because when you were making Adventure 4, you knew what had happened in 1 and 2 and 3. You had that ability to say, I know what the party is up to. I know what they have succeeded at. I know what they have failed at. And so ultimately, I think doing a sandbox style game gives you a greater sense of satisfaction as a game master because you get to legitimately be curious and interested in your own game. And you get to ask fun questions of your party members, of your players, and be delighted and surprised by their you know answers but then also your players get that rewarding sense that what they're doing matters and that the world that they're exploring and taking actions in is responding to them not to some pre-written path um so uh let me uh, kind of circle back a little bit here because I kind of got off on the off on the topic. Um, because I want to talk about you know that that's that's fundamental philosophy, but let's talk about for me my approach and and you know uh, my preferred style versus you know what your preferred style might be different. And we can talk about a little bit about why why my preferred style is my preferred style. Um. And actually, we're going to talk a little bit about, in my opinion, probably one of the, the best uses of, of Galarian. Again, Pathfinder 2 specifically. But I think fundamentally, and this is just my belief, that the more, the more sticky, the more tacky that your campaign is, and I'm going to explain what that I mean here in a second, the better. Too many people try to create, in what is in my opinion, a super generic, boring campaign. Uh, Edward, for a true sandbox, wouldn't you need to have a bunch of pre-built dungeons, NPCs, cities, etc.? That way your players have options. Edward, yeah, absolutely. You are 100% correct, Edward. You definitely will want to um, do some work in advance to have a couple of different options. Now, Edward, this is where we're not gonna get too much into these, but we did do a live stream a while, a couple months ago on oracles, not the Pathfinder 2 class, but on random tables and how you can use random tables to actually inspire you both before a session and even during a session in the case that your players kind of go off the beaten path. But it is true, Edward, that you do need to keep um, a couple of things in your back pocket. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, Edward, but that is a good point. GM Scott tipped $5. Hey. The adventure path is just one of the more than 14 million timelines. A sandbox campaign lets you explore any of them. Exactly, GM Scott. When you think about how many different things can happen in a D&D campaign and realize that an adventure path, it can only presume that the PCs did one thing exact thing and so you know we play rpgs because we want our pcs to explore and we want our pcs to do something incredible ben and amazing 50 dollars whoa ben this is a great point overall sandbox doesn't have to equal super random it's just an adaptive framework with open-ended outcomes yes ben it, absolutely and and i think that comes down to style i think ben is a great is an exact point you know sandboxes don't have to be random a sandbox can be a carefully curated environment. You could also just use random tables. And there's pros and cons, by the way, to both of those. I should really point this out. I, you know, sometimes it's best better to use a mix. I there are times where I think planning out ideas ahead of time is nice. But what you have to let go of is this idea of controlling the outcome, right? 
Um, and that's what you need to really focus on. As Ben says, it's, it's a framework. A sandbox isn't a map, okay? A sandbox is a is a uh, game board okay it's a it's a a board game where you are showing and highlighting the possibilities and you are making sure that you have a way to communicate to your play group what the relative state of affairs are in the world and what their potential options are now sometimes that's a map like a literal physical map but it doesn't have to be um you could have a sandbox campaign that takes place inside of a castle. But the map for that campaign might be everyone's current political alliances, whether they are siding with the king, or, you know, the, the greens or the blacks to, you know, quote, you know, House of the Dragon. Um, or do they belong to a third faction? And what are their alliances there? That's your map. What you're showing the players is this is the rough look of things. This is what the game board looks like. Here are where the pieces are. And based off of where you are on the game board, here are your available moves. And so Edward, to your point, you know, but how does having a bunch of pre-built dungeons NPCs mesh with only being one step ahead? If we can imagine a, a sort of a game board, if the, if the PCs are here on the start space, Okay, and we know that the options are like this. Okay, and we have yeah, we have some rough ideas about some options out here. Uh, maybe we think there's a cool idea that we have that this could lead to this, could lead to this. You know, maybe we vaguely have an idea over here. Maybe we even got really creative and exciting and we built this. What we're doing is we're kind of mapping out the possibility space. And yes, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight ideas. Maybe there's even an idea right here, nine ideas, 10 ideas. But we only have to really fully define, I would say, two to three of them. In fact, my magic number is three. I like to give my players three options pretty much at every spot. And in that regard, while we can think about these ideas and we should be considering them, the key is we do not have an expectation that the party will go this way and then they're gonna go this way and then they're gonna go this way. They might not do that. This is just a possible idea that I think would be fun and exciting. I will put this hook out in front of them and the party could choose to ignore it. They could say, no, this is way more interesting to us. This is what we care about. And at that point, now you get to play this fun like mini game. In fact, I would say that the the OG, you know, people like, you know, have the, the, the journaling games. They have like the solo RPGs. I think the original journaling game, I think the original solo journaling game was sort of the DM after a session, evaluating what happened in that, uh, you know, in that camp, in that session and sitting down and saying, how does my world respond? What changes should I make in my campaign world to reflect the actions, the victories, the failures, the consequences, the rewards that the PCs did tonight? How did what they did change my world? And again, you know, you could think of it again as sort of like a, a gradient of focus. You know, we I don't have to worry about what the PCs did, how it's going to affect something all the way over here, because this is just totally off of the beaten path. I only need to think about the immediate couple of options that were happening on before. If, let's say, at the beginning of a campaign, I told the party, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but let's say I told the party that, uh, you know, they were in the town and they came to the town because they heard rumors of an ancient tomb uh, of, an, of a once great knight, now said to be haunted and cursed, um, but uh, the ancient treasures of that 
that ancient knight still lay within the depths, right? Just a classic dungeon, site-based encounter. But I also give them a hook where they hear that, uh, you know, bandit attacks are on the rise and that bandits have been seen, uh, you know, have burned, you know, have attacked a couple of outlying farms. Now the, the party says, yeah, we want to go explore dungeons. So they go into the ancient tomb and cool. Now for the next couple of weeks, this is my focus. I build out the ancient tomb. I make a cool dungeon and map, you know, staying a couple you know, rooms or levels ahead of the party. And they continue to explore that. And by the way, they might not ever finish the ancient tomb. They might get bored with it and try something else. But that's besides the point. Let's say that they spend a couple of uh, uh, sessions at exploring the ancient tomb, maybe in game that takes place over a couple of months. Well, for me at home, I need to think about, okay, the party made their choice. And by the way, it's a good thing they went to the ancient tomb because there was a necromancer there who was trying to raise those fallen knights as a sort of uh, undead army and was planning to march on the town or march on the nearby city. And the party was in, you know, able to go in there and kick ass and take names. And they stopped the necromancer by putting him to the sword before he could accomplish his deeds. I didn't know they were going to do that but it's cool that they did. And the party should realize what they have accomplished. When the party realizes, wait, 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 Derek, if we had gone and dealt with the bandits, what would have happened with that necromancer guy? And you go, oh, I don't know. He probably would have succeeded, animated the really powerful undead knights as like a form of grave guard or tomb guard, probably would have marched on the city Maybe we could have played it out. I don't know. Maybe he would have killed them all. I don't know. Added their corpses to his growing zombie army. Yeah, it probably would have been horrible. And like the party will go, wow, holy shit. It, it's awesome that we went and did that then because there were real consequences at stake here. But also realize by the going to the ancient tomb, you now have to decide. So what has happened with these bandits? Now here you could use a random table. You could give yourself some percent chances or... As a GM, you can just decide. You see, the players have given you permission. And, and this is almost like in PBTA, we talk about golden opportunities. The idea that in Power by the Apocalypse, the GM can make a move when the players hand them a golden opportunity, right? Um, this is almost like a campaign golden opportunity. The, P the players have indicated to you, Derek, you told us about the bandits. You told us about the ancient tomb. We went to the ancient tomb. We are implicitly giving you permission to say, yeah, the bandit attacks, you can decide what happens, right? Now, maybe I, the GM, I want to just randomly roll because I want to see what happens. But I could also, I am totally fine. You are not fudging. You are not uh, uh, doing anything bad. You're not being a modern day railroad as GM by deciding that the bandit attacks have now escalated. And now there's the bandit lord, all right, who has enough wealth um, that he has started to amass his own, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe his own fiefdom or his own, uh, uh, you know, community of, of, of bandits, you know, that they're actually now an organized force. I'm not doing any, but this is what I was talking about earlier when I talked about with Damien about the sandbox about... My B what about my story? What about my BBEG? The idea, just because you're rolling a sandbox doesn't mean that you have to stop being creative. In fact, I would argue that this is the best form of creativity because rather than sitting there by yourself and getting to do whatever you want, you are working and doing this collaboratively with your players. There are some RPGs, maybe not Pathfinder 2 or 5th edition, but there are some RPGs where you might literally be doing this with the party, like at the table. But there's also nothing wrong with in, you know, in the intervening weeks while the party is exploring the ancient tombs, you decide that the bandit attacks have escalated and now there is the great bandit lord. And the bandit lord has, uh, you know, has is creating a keep and a hold fast out in the wilderness. And he is beginning a raid of, you know, of destruction against the nearby kingdom. And as for fun, you go, you know what, actually, the bandit lord, he's an he's an exile. He's an exile noble. He's actually maybe a good guy. He's actually fighting against the government 
of this land, which is corrupt. But you don't say, and then the party joins them, and then they work together to overthrow the corrupt. You, you stop yourself. You ask the question. You set up an interesting story. Because see, now, as a GM, I'm, I wonder, I'm like, oh, bandit tax. Okay, bandit lord. But what if he was a good guy? Or at least what if his motives weren't like purely selfish? What if he was exiled and he sees the current, you know, a noble as being corrupt and he wants to seize power for himself? I wonder what the PCs will do. And, and I stop there because I don't want to have an answer because I legitimately want to be surprised when the party goes and maybe they go and deal with the bandit lord. Maybe they put him to the sword. Maybe they join with him. Maybe they discredit him. Maybe they take him prisoner. Maybe they join with the corrupt noble because they offer the corrupt noble more aligns with their goals. I don't know. But for me as a GM, it's like now I'm getting to read the book. Now I'm getting to, to see the movie happen because my players are providing me with this excitement that I would never have gotten in any other place. But like I said, you never let sleeping dogs lie because when the bandit Lord rises to power and the ancient tombs have been quelled, you are always going to be creating new threats, new opportunities that the party is either going to have to engage with, ignore, try to balance and deal all of it. And like I said, if you get too many, it could be overwhelming. You know, if the party only has to deal with like one to two things, uh, you know, that can feel like it's uh, it's manageable. Personally, I think that like three to four things is where the party feels like I, I, I think that's like the sweet spot. And if they have five or more things to deal with, that can be overwhelming. Um, some party, you know, that's over. Well, some party members or some parties will respond well to that. They'll like all of the, you know, all the intrigue and all of the multiple things and having to play different, you know, factions against one another and all this other stuff. Um, but some people don't. So, you know, three to four things. And, you know, Theophrastus is saying, I often use that Bandit Lord twist. Listen, let me tell you something here. Do not be afraid to use tropes. You don't always have to be like, you're not a, you're not a Hollywood writer. You're not writing for even uh, you're not writing for, you know, an audience of millions of people like a Hollywood writer would. But even an adventure path writer has to create an adventure that people are going to pay money for that. They, uh, you know, are going to have to sell to tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people. You are making an adventure for your four or five friends or at least your four or five you know players. And you're the GM like you're already doing enough. OK. When you base things off of simple, easy to understand concepts and tropes, players get it. It's, they understand it. Trust me, what the players do is going to throw enough of their own unique spin on the whole thing to make it unique and you in and uniquely yours. Uh, I use tropes all the time, and I agree with Saint Valentine. Some things are tropes because they work and they work well. You know, we've always talked about the difficulty in role playing games about, you know, communicating information and getting information across to your players when you can just go, yeah, 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 yeah. He's like a Robin Hood. People go, oh, cool. We, we get it. We can we are now informed and now we can make, you know, <laughs> we can make the interesting uh, decisions because I don't want I don't, you know. I'm less interested in, are they going to find out that he's actually a good guy? I'm more interested because that's not the question I asked. I could have asked that question, by the way. But to me, the interesting question was, what will they do when they find out he is a good guy? Or if they find out he's a good guy, what will they do? So that's not information that I'm going to necessarily make difficult for them to acquire. Um. So, yeah. Um. Frostjack asked, how does the two to three issues rule of thumb change when applied to a West Marches game? Actually, Frostjack, I think that's still pretty much exactly the same. Um, if you were playing a West Marches game, you want to give your party two or three, you know, hooks or rumors. Um, they've heard about the, 
the frost barons that lay out in the you know the the, the iron hills they've heard about the uh you know nearby orcish fort or the nearby old fort which is infested with goblins right you're giving them two or three hooks um and then you're letting them explore and then every couple sessions you can in, you know give them more hooks and more hooks um and by the way this is kind of more of a D&D specific thing but like one of the things I love to do is the idea of cuz it, it 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 buys you time cuz you don't have to do it right away you know let's just say we're using like let's just say we're using Pathfinder 2 as an example okay you give the party you know uh essentially you give them a level 1 hook and say oh there's you know there's goblin warriors that have taken up residence in the old you know the old uh the old fort uh oh yes but there's also been reports that uh rat people have been seen skulking about the cities and the you know in the in the you know the sewers and the uh and the, the alleyways also there's supposedly a trio of medusae which inhabit an ancient temple dedicated to a dark god. Okay, cool. Uh, that's not a hook that we are reasonably expecting our players to go and deal with, especially not in Pathfinder 2, uh, probably not even in D&D, because that's just too high level. But one of the advantages or one of the fun parts of kind of creating these structures and creating these things out there is you can kind of set this expectation, this future expectation because the party will remember from the very beginning of the campaign, oh yeah, those Medusas. And you know, they go and fight goblins and orcs and ogres. And then before you know it, like one day they're level five or they're level six and you go, and they go, hey, you know, remember the Medusa? We should go explore that. Now Strat asks, would you explicitly call out the level of hook or at least when the players ask? I don't know that you have to explicitly call it out Strat. Okay, I don't know that you have to explicitly call it out, but I don't think it is a bad idea, as I always say, to let your players be properly informed so they can make real decisions. Player agency comes from the player's decisions mattering and from them making informed decisions. Um, telling them about an ancient ruin dedicated to a dark cursed god, when I know that it's a level eight adventure um, and they're level one, I think is more of a gotcha, or you're certainly starting to get into gotcha territory. It's going to depend on your group. It's going to depend on your GMing style. Um, I don't necessarily know that I would uh, not explicitly call it out. Certainly, Strat, if they uh, spent some time in town or researched or spent some money on a sage or, you know, took some sort of initiative to figure out and find out more about it, I would want to reward that behavior. That's behavior I like to reward, you know, getting involved, asking questions, being more interested in the campaign. And I want to reward that because I want that to repeat them behavior. And by rewarding them with, yep, this is the level, you know? Um, and so it's like, okay, you know, that's really, really cool. Um, because now they feel like I, I got rewarded and I know what I, I got the information that I need to know. Um, it's also, by the way, behooves you to sort of throw that out there. You know, like for example, you might tell them, um, you know, legend speak of the, of the cash, of magic weapons that, you know, lay in that, um, uh, in that ancient place. Uh, you know, it's plus one elemental striking weapons, right? With the runes. So it's like the players, when they're level one or two or three, right? They're like salivating at the idea of getting a plus one flame striking weapon, right? Or whatever. But now they know where one is. They also know we can't fight it yet because, you know, a bunch of Medusas is too high of a level for challenge for us. But now we have a goal, right? Outside of maybe wanting to do the right thing and do what's good and do what's advantage, we are now all getting them to buy into the core premise of most, you know, fantasy 20, you know, uh, you know fantasy 20 games, which is, you know, level up, do cooler shit but now we're actually giving them something cooler to do. It's not something they have to do. You see, in an adventure path, leveling up only means that you now have to do something else. This is something you get to do. 
And that is a very big difference, I think, philosophically, um, because it feels like a reward. Uh, we had a super chat here I think I missed. Yeah, Save Versus says, if you have a job board style game, secretly have a, if ignored X time, Y happens. A lost puppy isn't gonna stay lost for a year. Well, yeah, Save, yeah, save Versus, that's a great idea. Um, in, in fact, we, we could talk about, we'll talk about fronts here in a second. Um, uh, this this topic has sort of made me wa wander all over the place. I wanted to, I, I, I do wanna give exact specific functional advice. Um, all right. When I create a campaign, I think you should have, and this is, again, I like to tie into tropes. I like for my campaigns to be sticky and understandable and recognizable. I don't try to do the kitchen sink approach. I don't try to make my campaign, oh, it's the most generic, bland fantasy available. I like for my my campaign, okay, my sandbox, um, to have a hook. You might call it a gimmick, okay? There are five hooks or gimmicks that you can sort of rely on. One is culture or cultural. Two is the environment, okay? Three is class or a race. And by the way, Pathfinder 2 gives us some really cool options for this. Four is an opposition. And five is a situation, okay? In my personal opinion, the more distinct and the more gimmicky you make your campaign, the more successful it's going to be. I know that sounds crazy, but you want your campaign to stand out. You know, there's a lot of problems I have. I, I actually really do like, um, you know, the Forgotten Realms. And, uh, so you know, but it, sometimes it is just too much. Hey, CCAV, just renewed for 13 months. Thank you, CCAV, for that renewal. That's very sweet. Thank you very much. Um, Beowulf asks, are fronts basically faction clocks from Blades in the Dark? Actually, fronts predate clocks. Clocks came from fronts, Beowulf, uh, actually. So, um, <laughs> but yes, yes, fronts are basically faction clocks. That is a that is the correct way to think of them, even though clocks kind of derived from fronts. Um, okay, so I believe that your campaign should have a hook and to give an example of this, look at the last actual play that the Knights of Last Call did. We played Quest for the Frozen Flame. Now, the reason I chose an adventure path turned out to have some problems, but the reason why I chose that adventure path is because I felt like it had a really strong hook or gimmick. It was obviously uh, kind of a mix, right, between cultural and environmental. It was the idea of we are going to play a campaign in the realm of the Mammoth Lords. We are going to have a very primitive tribal people who, uh, you know, in fact, you could argue it kind of it kind of dipped into the class and race who are humans, first and foremost, and do not have spellcasters of the arcane or occult variety because such things would be sort of anathema to those people. It creates a very unique and instantaneous tell to your players this isn't just like any other campaign and this is part of the reason why um and, and i wanted to say like this is one of the reasons why i kind of like golarian if you ignore the rest of golarian each different little region or country in golarian is like a cool unique gimmicky thing oh here's the nation that's everything's undead and like you know uh undead or everywhere Oh, okay. That's that's that that's cool. Oh, here's the nation that's at war with the demons. Okay. Here's the nation that is um, you know, uh has weird sci-fi alien tech. But for that to be successful, you kind of just have to ignore the rest of the campaign world. You really have to focus in on just one area. You know, I was going to play Quest for the Frozen Flame. These people were from the realm of the Mammoth Lords. 
I wanted the campaign to be about the Realm of the Mammoth Lords in the Realm of the Mammoth Lords with characters from the Realm of the Mammoth Lords. This is part of the reason why I get so frustrated when I see people making parties or when I see people making campaigns and they kind of just allow everything, right? Where they kind of just, you know, everybody everybody gets everything. Um, oh, I'm, I'm a weird creature from the jungle. Oh, I'm a frost person from this city. Oh, I'm from over here. It's like, there's no cohesion. There's no hook. There's no gimmick. Um, you know, if you look at some of the most evocative, you know, campaigns that people think about, you know, environment, think Dark Sun, right? Here is a harsh world where, you know, the, the ruled by deserts and, um, uh, you know, you could argue there's an opposition, right? You have these, you have these tyrannical, um, sorcerer kings who keep everybody under a leash, right? That is going to create this evocative campaign world that is going to immediately stand out from all the other campaigns that you have done prior and past um, or in the future. So I think picking a tone, uh, picking a hook or a gimmick about your campaign, I think is really, really important and trying to stay focused and, and tied into that, right? Um, so yeah. And also too, it, it, it's also a great time. We didn't, I don't want to get super off track. We'll probably do two parts of this cause this is pretty good. Um, it's great for like a session zero as well, because you can sit, this is why also why I don't like when players have an idea of this is my character before I get to the, even get to the adventure. Right. Um, because when you get down and you start telling everybody, okay, guess what? In my world, um, divine magic is outlawed. Okay. Um, and primal magic is seen as being, um, you know, uh, potentially dangerous. Suddenly it's like, okay, well, it might be harder for us to have magical healing in this world. We, we might need to think about building our characters differently. Than I would. Yeah, I, I want to build my optimal double slice uh, flensing strike fighter, but maybe I have to do something different. Maybe I have to, you know, adjust my character and its concept to better fit into this, I, you know, this concept of this world. Same thing, you know, to use kind of like forbidden lands. If I go, hey, my campaign is set in, you know, frost world. <laughs> right where it's cold all the time and it's you know the bitter north um you and you kind of base and you could even be very upfront with the party and be like we're going to be doing a lot more uh survival checks we're going to be doing a lot more environmental uh issues it's going to change the way that people build their characters there's this pressure this external pressure to make their characters different and unique it will tie them in to your campaign more and more um, and so one of the things, again, like I always say is uh, the more sticky and the more tactile you can make your campaign, um, I think the better and more successful um, it is. Um, so after you uh, pick um, this idea about your about your idea of this, and again, I use the term world, but it doesn't have to be a world because you don't necessarily have to design a world. Like I said, I don't think there's anything wrong with using Galarian and saying, hey, we're going to stick to this part of Galarian um, or I'm going to create my campaign world, but it's probably just this, you know, reasonably small chunk of it. And remember, never force yourself, uh, never force yourself to create more than you must, right? Was our, was our first rule of dungeon craft. So um, you know, that's, you know, that is certainly the case where you might have some ideas of what's going on with the rest of the world, but you definitely don't want to sit there and, and be too preoccupied with it. Um, now, uh, Carzoni says, I'm hundred percent with you on that. I've been setting up to run gatewalkers and I had multiple players ignore the player's guide and make characters without reading it at all. Right. And again, if you're familiar, when I ran Quest for the Frozen Flame, I told everybody they needed to be human. They could not be wizard or witch. Um, they could not use arcane or occult power source um, that, uh, you know, I would maybe allow one of the four people party to be a non-human 
um, to represent sort of being an outsider. Uh, most of them were going to be Kelid. Like I put pretty staunch requirements on them because that was the kind of campaign that I was going for. Um, now, when most people start thinking about making a sandbox, uh, the thing that they start thinking about, like I said, is, is making a map. And while I think maps are useful, I also think maps are highly overrated. Um, and what I mean by that is when we think about a map, right? Uh, we think about and this, this, this uh, there's a great YouTube channel, the name escapes me, but he had a great video about this. You know, we traditionally think of maps like, you know, like what we would see from the Inner Sea World Guidebook, right? The Galarian map. We think about the, the map of the Forgotten Realms, right? That we see, right? Like, you know, with sketching out all the landforms and there's all the little cities and oh, here's a forest, you know, and oh, there's some mountains over here, right? And we see all of these different yeah, uh, uh, ideas. Map Crow, yes, Hoyra. Fantastic. He did a fantastic video about this. And, and he goes on to say, like, these maps are beautiful. These maps are awesome. Uh, we should we should totally love and respect these maps. But honestly, they're not very good at being what we need them to be. Because what we need isn't necessarily maps. What we need are game boards. Okay. And what you need to think about your map as is really more like a playing place, you know, um, uh, a board game with different playing spaces that are connected together. Okay. And if this, by the way, if this starts to look familiar, um, it's because it's also the same principle for designing a good dungeon. Um, what you want to do is you want to use a map to create interesting opportunities for your players and then make it very, very, very apparent what is the challenge that they have to overcome to do that. So for example, if we have our, you know, small little starting town here, okay? And I'm trying to, uh, over here, we put that, uh, you know, that ancient crumbled ruin, uh, this is a horrible map, but we put that ancient crumbled ruin, okay? Full of lost treasures. Um, the party wants to go there, okay? And they want to loot the treasures there. But in between, there is the dark woods, the spider haunt woods, right? Ooh, spooky, right? There's a spider, okay? But having one choice isn't interesting. Map Crow, again, describes this beautifully. So we also say, oh, well, you could go to the south and you could go through the uh, the ancient hills, okay? But those are filled with hostile orcs, right? Urgh, orcs, <laughs> okay? Um, and, you know, the orc tribes there aren't necessarily at war with the people of the city, but they're also not necessarily very friendly either, right? Whereas the spiders will definitely want to eat you for lunch, but the spiders are, you know, just a dumb, dumb insect. So right off the bat, you are giving your players interesting options, but more importantly, your map it isn't really a map. Right, it's more like a illustrated uh, flow chart is really what it is, and I actually think that that's better. I th I think that you know, look, there's a time and a place for hex crawling and doing all that, and if you and your group like that, that's fine, and you should do that. But hex crawling assumes that the what the party is interested in is the land itself is the terrain itself. And my experience has been that very few people, at least at least nowadays, at least in the you know the the 21st century uh are as interested in that as maybe they used to be. If your group is different, your group is different, and you should definitely do that. But what I have found is that my groups are more interested in the destination, right? Than the journey. 
and they are more interested in going on the adventure and going to go to the, to the cool place to do the cool thing um, than they are necessarily in just, you know, exploring the wilderness for exploring the wilderness's sake. All right. Um, now, I'm not, not saying that you can't do that, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the age old let's wander around the wilderness and see what happens can be fun sometimes it can be appealing and there's definitely people who really really like that but you know um uh uh i think most of the time you're better served doing something else uh great role-playing debbie fr great friend of the show as well uh with a ten dollar super chat says this is where just knowing the vibe is important if you know what the vibe is for an area you don't need to make it it's already half exists before the pen goes to paper. Just make the rest up. Absolutely. I mean, again, Dungeon World says, right? Right? Draw maps. Leave blanks. You know, if I have a problem with things like Forgotten Realms and Galarian, is that, you know, they've, they've forgotten to include the blanks. You know, we we haven't, you know, I haven't described what's, what's north of the spider haunt woods, right? That doesn't mean there's nothing there. It means, I don't know, I'm kind of leaving it open. You know, we'll figure it out later. We, you know, uh, if some, and you know what, by the way, this we're getting a little off topic here because this isn't really about sandbox. But if a player at your table looks at your little drawing, okay, and goes, what's north of the spider haunt woods? You just turn to them and say, that's a great question. What is north of the spider haunt woods? And just, I don't let them make it up. And you go, cool, yeah, I'll draw that on the map next time. Uh, obviously, it's not there today, but let's make something interesting. Or I'm leaving a blank because maybe later on I need there to be a, uh, a you know, a set of a raging river with a, you know, a terrifying waterfall for something that I want to do. Well, cool, I'll put it there. You know, it, it wasn't it wasn't a problem until it needed to be put there. But we kind of left it blank on purpose because right now this is not, you know, this is all the party is, has to deal with, right? We've got the ancient tomb over here. We've got the spider haunt woods. We have the orcs inhabiting the bandits or uh, sorry, the orcs inhabiting the uh, hillside. And then we have the great road, which leads to the mighty kingdoms to the south and uh, attacking the road, right? We have our, we have our bandits, right? Who are attacking the caravans that are coming down from the great resource rich north and attacking the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, or, or the, 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 the caravans which are heading from the great mines of the north to the great uh, kingdoms to the south. And, you know, uh, already we, we've kind of given the, the group all sorts of different things. Oh, by the way, they say that uh, in the middle of the spider haunt woods, legend says hidden somewhere is an ancient tower, a tower with no doors where great arcane secrets are kept. That literally might be all I, I know. I have no idea what I'm putting in there. Or maybe I do have an idea of what I want to put in there. Maybe there's a I don't know, extra dimensional evil that's been sealed inside the tower. I think that's a cool idea. I'm just going to put that out there. But you can just throw these things into your game and just see what sticks. And guess what? If the party never asks you about the tower and you don't even care about the tower after a couple sessions, you forget about, you just ignore it. And this, by the way, is the ultimate power of a sandbox. And this is what I, I was kind of hinting at at the beginning of the stream. You see, and, and GM Scott says the Ghost Tower of Inverness, which is a classic D&D &D module. Back in the day, they used to make these quote unquote adventures. They really, they weren't called adventures. They were called modules. And the idea of the module was that this was a pre-written, pre-formatted, short, kind of self-contained location or event it didn't have any wide ranging connections to the whole rise of the rune lords and the stopping of the extra dimensional you know threats of the universe it's just one cool location with some cool stuff all happening inside of it and if that if you buy that 
you could go ahead and go bloop, and you can just set it down and just put it into your world and say, okay, there's that. And I'm going to drop some hooks and I'm going to let the party know, oh, you've heard about this uh, really cool site, the, the Hall of the Rainbow Mage. And it's like, oh, what's what's the Hall of the Rainbow Mage? Guess what? It's an adventure module that was written by Necromancer Games like in 2002. I own it. But you, it, it, it's not part of some epic, long-lasting campaign. It's just a cool site with some cool stuff that happens in there. And you could just drop it in the campaign. And the party can investigate it, or they could not. And if they don't investigate it, you could totally maybe have some consequences happen and have trouble stir up. Or you could just ignore it. You're not, you're not, you're not duty bound to make everything a pain in the ass. If you don't care about it, they don't care about it. And you know what the beautiful thing about it is? If you buy this module and the party never goes there, cool. Just use it for your next campaign, you know, or repurpose it and use it, uh, you know, change it up a little bit or, or scuff it up a little bit. Or, you know, be like, if the party is like, you're, you're trying to decide, oh, well, they came to this keep, but they found a vault that had a key that they could not, a, a vault that was locked that they couldn't figure it out. And you're like, well, where would the key be? And you're like, fuck it, I'll put the key. I bought this module. I'll just put the key in there. Now they have an extra reason to go there. Maybe they will. They still might not, but that's okay because the party is the are the ones who are making all the decisions. Um, and I, I, I love modules. Great role-playing, Debbie. I love them. I wish they kept making them. Exactly, GM Scott, a modular site meant to be explored. There's also something to be said about modular, quote unquote, adventures, which is usually some sort of, uh, you know, condensed event or storyline. I'm okay with that as long as it doesn't have a, you know, it doesn't have to, a world ending apocalyptic thing. I think as dungeon masters and as DMs, I'm guilty of this. I know Smith is guilty of this. Um, we, we tend to, you know, we, we're constantly pushing the gas pedal. Right. Everything has got to be big and epic and it's not cool unless everyone's going to die, unless the world is going to be destroyed. We, we have this tendency to overplay the consequences of things because we want things to feel important and meaningful. But the problem is when you do that, then the party feels like, well, we have to stop all of this. And it, and, and it can become very frustrating. You need to make sure that not everything is, ap is apocalyptic. Not everything is going to you know destroy or de you know, derail the whole world. Um, you know, the other thing while we're, we're talking about this in terms of making a sandbox, again, something I have personally found is, you know, when you, whenever, whenever you are designing something for your campaign, actually, I'm going to give you two pieces of advice here. Okay. The first piece of advice is, and this is old advice. Okay, from a Dragon Magazine, old advice. It's whenever you create uh, a new, uh, you know, I'll, I'll use the quotes here, major uh, piece for your campaign. Create a secret for it. And what I mean by that is when I create the spider haunt woods, I should create a secret or two connected to the spider haunt woods. Part of the reason I think we all uh, fundamentally play these games is because we want to explore and we want to learn and we want to uncover things, right? That is, I think, definitely part of the appeal of role-playing games is to feel like we're gaining mastery over the world. And, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Dungeon World says, you know, a lot of people assume that Dungeon World is this like completely quantum game where, you know, the secret door doesn't exist unless the players roll really high on uh, a check. That's what makes the secret door appear or the trap didn't exist until they rolled badly on their die roll. Actually, Dungeon World does not actually describe doing any of that. In fact, there are GM moves in Dungeon World that say things like, look to your prep, use what is written there. Um, 
So part of the, the, this is, this is part of the reason I like prepping. This is, this is kind of going back to the whole randomness thing. Doing things randomly can be a lot of fun, but you lose out on that cool ability to foreshadow stuff. And one of the cool things about creating things like a um, secret, and by the way, I, what I used to do is anytime I'd write a secret, I guess nowadays I'd probably put it like in a Google, Google sheet or like a Trello board, but I used to put them on a, a, a note, an index card, like a three by five index card. And sometimes what I would do is when I was making a new adventure, I would just kind of randomly shuffle up that deck of secrets and pull one out and be like, cool, how can I give a clue or a hint about some other secret that's in the world in this particular location or this particular event. Um, it's like a really cool way of showing this kind of like foreshadowing basically and highlighting the fact that your world feels more interconnected. It's that, that is the main reason, it's the only reason I don't like purely randomly generating stuff. Like when I play Blades in the Dark, I pretty much play completely no prep. If I need something at the table, I'll kind of make it up at the spot or I'll roll on a random table. But sometimes I feel like my Blaze in the Dark games do suffer a little bit because I'm not able to kind of lay out those breadcrumbs in advance. Now keep in mind, I, that, that just because I'm laying out breadcrumbs, the party may never follow them. Just because I put a secret in the world doesn't mean the party has to uncover it, right? But when they do, it becomes that much more satisfying. So, you know, secrets to me are a cool way to sort of add sort of an element to your game that sort of lets you go deeper. And kind of connected to that is whenever you, you know, whenever you create a, a major piece for your campaign, add something fantastic. And I think that this just makes things stick out more in players' minds. Too often I see people, I see adventures that are just towns. Idea. We're playing a fantasy game. And I see these towns that are so, or these dungeons, or these monsters, whatever. They're just so boring. They feel like... They're like some, they feel, you know, they feel like you're at a Renaissance fair because it, it doesn't quite feel medieval. Um, it feels like very anachronistic, you know, and, I, and I'm going to shit on Galarian here a little bit, but like, you know, Absalom, it's like the center of this, it's the biggest city in the world. And like, how do they make it interesting by having newspapers and like, I don't know, uh, bicycles or whatever, like that to me isn't fantastical. Like we're playing a fantasy game of magic and dragons and fantastic beasts and horrifying monsters and incredible, powerful gods and angels and demons. It's, there are so many cooler ways, I think, to make your game fantastic. It might be kind of tropey, but it goes back to that stickiness concept that I was talking about before. You know, a real world is mundane enough and so many things in your campaign are already going to be mundane. Um, you know, make make your fantastical fantasy world fantastic. Make it an exciting, magical place where, you know, it, things are happening. Like, if you want to play a very low fantasy, grim, dark game, you know, that's fine. Uh, the pe People are buying in for that. But if you're playing your basic standard fantasy 20, you know, your Pathfinder 2 or your... Uh, 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 Dungeons and Dragons, like those are those are pretty fantastical worlds, and so you know, yeah, like like lean into it. You know, GM Scott says continual flame can be cast by almost everyone in Galarian. Why do they have candles and torches in Major City? Yeah, like there is there, this is that's that's the other danger though. GM Scott is if you make magic seem like a commodity, if you make the fantastical seem like the normal or the mundane, I think it loses some of its allure. Like, um, you know, like imagine, uh, you know, imagine going to an elven city and the way you reach the upper boughs is like, you know, treants, uh, you know, carry you up 
you know, lift you up into the upper boughs of the city. Already, it's, it's like, you know, or like, you know, like there's like a patrolling ring of treant guards around this elven city or this elven enclave, and they lift you up and carry you up into the city, into the branches. Like already, you're like, okay, well, okay, that's cool. It's fantasy, but it's also not diminishing it, right? It's not turning the treants into like elevators, right? You you have to strike a, a balance, and it, it can be difficult sometimes, but, um, you know, that's... That's ultimately, I think, part of the, the 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 fun, but the challenge as well of being a dungeon master is you want to create something fantastic without making it seem mundane or, uh, uh, you know, just prosaic, right? You want it to feel like it is something miraculous and cool. And, you know, you want your players to sort of lean into it and be like, wow, that is that is cool. Like, that's a cool idea. That's a fun concept. Um, and... Yeah, I, I, again, I think I, my, the trend that I see more and more in fantasy these days is um, not only not, not, the commodiz not the commoditization of magic or fantasy, but just the removing of the fantasy and making modern day fantasy games really feel more modern, <laughs> like with trappings of weirdness. Like, again, it feels more like uh, people living in the real world, but at a Renaissance fair. And they're just pretending that they live in some magical world. Um, you know, the, the idea of the mystery and the magic, I think, are an important part of making something fantastic. Um, again, these aren't necessarily related to sandboxes. I'm just saying these are just two pieces of advice I, that I have for that. Uh, doesn't Eberron do the commodification of magic as a key part of it? And is it considered a great setting? Not everybody loves Eberron. I do. Um, but yes, I mean, the commoditization of magic is part of that game's you know, core conceit. If we go back up to, um, and if we go back up to this, right. Um, you know, clearly in Eberron, the, the idea of like the, the, the class, like the wizard being almost a uh, hyper prevalent there, you know, wizards aren't just some Oh, it's some ancient sage in a tower, a rare individual. Very few people can become a mage. No, like there's an NPC class called like the Mage Rite or the Mage Smith, who is basically like a low level wizard who uses magic to make horseshoes and make plows and make, you know, uh, cooking knives that are just, you know, extra sweet because they're magical. Right. So that that game took this idea and leaned into it. Um so it's, you know, it's, yes, it's deliberate about it. Um, Eric did not expect to catch us, but here he is. Welcome, Eric. Um, yeah, Lollipop. Exactly. Like, that's a cool idea. You know, a migrating city, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, the, 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 the dwarves summon great earth elementals and they can move their city every year with the harvest or something. I don't know, you know, like just make it cool and big and awesome and like impressive and, but fantastical. And I think that makes things more memorable because at the end of the day, that is what we're doing with these campaigns is we're trying to create awesome experiences for our players who will then remember, you know, everything that we did uh, later on. All right. Um, I took so many notes here. Um, so, yeah, I, I just want to, I'm going to read this passage from Dungeon World uh, just because it's uh, it's so good. Um, the agenda of Dungeon World is to make the world fantastic, fill the characters' lives with adventure, and play to find out what happens. Everything you say, create, and do at the table and away from the table is to accomplish these three goals and no others. Things that aren't on this list are not your goals. You're not trying to beat the players or test their abilities to solve complex traps. You're not here to give the players a chance to explore your finely crafted setting. And you're most certainly not here to tell everybody a pre-planned story. And that one deserves repeating. You are not here to tell everyone a planned story. Don't ever plan a storyline. You do not know what will happen to the player characters any more than they do. Your job is to portray 
an evolving and dynamic and fantastical world, not provide a canned plot. Um, and so ultimately, while that is about Dungeon World, that is at the heart of the sandbox concept. It's this idea that by providing opportunities for people um, to explore a, an area that the decisions that they make will be far more interesting than any sort of story or pre-written thing that I could have created. So um, I know I've been going for a while here, uh, but if anybody has any questions or anything that they want to kind of follow up about or a good point that they want to make, uh, go ahead and throw it in chat. Um, Cause again, we got about half an hour left here. Um, and there's still some stuff I want to talk about. I, I, I do want to talk about fronts, but we may have to do that just as a separate stream and just be like a, a stream about fronts um, and, and, and creating those. Um, I also think it'd be fun probably, you know, at the studio or something like that, we'd get Bob in here or something like that and just kind of cooperatively create with maybe with chat's help, um, you know, kind of create a basic sandbox world and sort of start it off. Um, Cause I think that that, that would be fun as well. Um, yes, Gossamer. That's actually a really great thing. Make your world fantastic and your plot hooks, simple tropes. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly that Gossamer. That's actually kind of, that is it because that way it's cool, but it's also relatable and it's understandable and people will get it right away. Um, because again, like, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of talking about, you know, fronts a little bit here, but like I can make this idea, right? Uh, you know, of, you know, of this like, okay, uh, so there's a, you know, there's an evil wizard who, you know, wants power, okay? And the first thing he's going to do is he's going to, um, you know, he's going to seize control of scary book, <laughs> some scary book. Then he's going to journey to ancient city. Then he's going to summon demon. Then he's going to uh, become all powerful, right? That is an example of a front. The difference is um, this is like series of steps that this evil wizard is trying to accomplish. And the difference is these things don't have to happen. Um, if my group comes in and kills the, the wizard here, then that's it's over, right? Um, uh, if, if he gets control of the scary book, he's headed for the ancient city next and the players can do something about it or they could not do something about it. Um, maybe they stop him. Maybe they don't. I, this is not a prescriptive, you know, list where these things must happen in order for my campaign to work out. In fact, I might not even have any real details written about any of these later ones. I just have some basic details about the wizard and, you know, this scary book is in a, an ancient library beneath the grand cathedral. And I kind of design a cool adventure or dungeon around that ancient library and the evil wizard trying to get the scary book. And maybe the party uh, stops him or maybe they don't. But the cool thing about it is I don't have to deal with it. But if the party doesn't stop him, the front sort of indicates to me, OK, that this is the next step. And exactly, GM Scott, you would have several of these fronts going at once. Um, and, you know, Dungeon World specifically kind of gives all sorts of uh, uh, terms and, um, you know, uh, uh, concepts. They talk about uh, the, uh, you know, the dangers of the front. They talk about the impending doom of the front. Um, and, you know, I think what I like to do in Dungeon World calls these stakes because remember the reason i don't know about you all i mean i mean this is a really important question to ask yourself why do you play 
role-playing games. And for me, it's because I like to see, I like to see what makes people tick. And, you know, I, I think it's interesting to see what my friends do and how they play their characters and what they make with these fantasy characters and what they have them do. Um, Dungeon World calls these stakes, but like these are more like for me, these are like the questions that as a GM, I kind of want to know or at least see what happens. Like, like one, like maybe I want to, one of the stakes might be like, um, you know, will a PC bind with the demon to prevent, uh, you know, the wizard from succeeding? You know, now this isn't guaranteed to happen, but, you know, I, I had this idea of like, well, you know, will the player, will, will someone be willing to sort of make this sort of sacrifice? And so maybe, you know, the we're in this part of the adventure and I had this thing and the, the necrom, you know, the wizard is about to summon the demon and, um, you know, there's an opportunity where the demon is still in spiritual form. And I make this comment about like, you know, or maybe the players have learned that the demon, they can suck, you know, they can junction the demon into them. And will a PC do that and which one and if they don't then what are they going to do i mean they don't they don't have to do this but like i like to have these kind of interesting questions sometimes i like to write them out because it's just like it reminds me of like oh yeah i wanted to see i kind of wanted to see what ha what would happen when, when they had to make the tough choice right kind of make them squirm a little bit uh ben with a question what are your thoughts on depth crawls versus a sandbox they generally have some guardrails that are easier for new GMs to handle without being prescripted nor totally open. Yeah, I, I, I'm I, coming around the idea of depth crawls and what Ben is talking about with depth, crawl, depth crawls are things like the Stygian Library, uh, the Gardens of Yin, which are these ideas of these, um, I, I, would, I would say procedurally generated, Ben, um, you know, dungeons or experiences that, um, aren't you know it's it, it, it's a bit like an adventure path and that you kind of have a, a pathway to follow but you know so there's some structure there but it's it, there's a random element to it and there's nothing that is so absolutely required um that you would that you would need to do that um my issue i think with depth crawls is that i think there is some value in you know, and, and I know, Ben, you, you've you kind of reached this point where it's like you want to have as minimal bias on the game as possible. You, we've talked about this, right? Like, I think this was being discussed on the Patreon the other day. I think you and Ayla was talking about about being a judge, right? A judge is an impartial referee, um, which is fine. And I, I do appreciate that to a certain extent. But I also feel like I'm here to play, too. And, you know, I don't want to just be, I don't always just want to be an impartial decider. And sometimes I like for my will to be manifest. I have ideas too. Like I said, I have questions that I want to ask. And I think when we get to these very procedurally generated or even just completely Oracle driven campaign experiences, I feel like I'm losing that a little bit. And that I think is for me, one of the, the draw brat backs to that style of play. I think what you're replacing is uh, you're still, you're still getting a sense of excitement because when you do a depth crawl or an Oracle based play, the question or the excitement is, you know, what's going to happen, right? Like you don't know what's going to happen next, right? You're going to roll it and the party's going to have to roll with the punches. Whereas for me, it's more like there are there's a specific situation that I want to see the group uh, deal with, and I don't have a stake in what happens. I just want to see what they do. And for me, that is a very interesting element. Anonymous tipped five dollars. Hey. Thanks for the great discussion, Derek. 
Stakes are one of the main things my players wanted out of our current game. They've already made a decision that caused a child in their family to die, and was the cliffhanger of our last session. Wish granted. That's that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it's not, it's not awesome that a child died, but like setting those stakes is, I think, important, especially if the players or you know, you know, what's what's at stake. Uh, I mean, I guess that's the term like a, a great example of this would be um, I'll, I'll use Rise of the Rune Lords as an example. Um, uh, yeah, by players, I, I hope you met PCs. Uh, I'm going to use Rise of the Rune Lords again because we, we've all talked about this a lot of times before. Um, you know, uh, a question I would want to say we would want to see is like, um, you know, if the PCs. Uh, could save, uh, gosh, what's her name? If the PCs could save Amiko, okay, or, you know, a dozen random townsfolk, which ones would they? Right. Um, that might be now. Look, th this may never happen. But what's at stake here is that if the town, uh, if they fail and the town gets as assaulted by Noalia or the giants or something like that, then this is a question that I want to have answered. I want to see what the group does with this situation. Maybe they'll surprise me. Maybe maybe they'll save both, um, or maybe they'll make a tough decision. But either way, they are showing me who they think their PC is. Um, and I think that that is something that I think a lot of GMs forget to do. Is to give the players a chance to show you who their PC is. And we need to put them in these tough moments to understand them and understand their motivations. Um, and so I think that that is, uh, you know, I think stakes are very, very important to me. And again, going back to it before, one of the reasons I like sandboxes is because while I do not control the outcome, I do get to be the person who puts interesting challenges in the party's way. Again, I'm doing it because I want to make the world fantastic and I want to fill their lives with danger and adventure and I want to see what happens but I'm doing it all from a, a place of curiosity how will the group deal with this not how will the group beat this because now I'm assuming that they're going to beat it how is the group going to respond to this circumstance how is the group going to respond to that circumstance now yes you can generate these questions and situations by rolling randomly. Tome of Adventure Design, I use it all the time or similar type uh, uh, books to give me inspiration or ideas. But at the end of the day, if I have an interesting idea or I have a cool concept, then I have no problem making it and putting it into my game. What I don't do is force the PCs down a road that is going to inevitably lead them to that question. That's not what's interesting to me. That shouldn't be what's interesting to any of us. We should really be interested in what the PCs are going to explore. And I should be curious about what they're curious about. And if you find frequently that you and your PC's goals aren't aligned, then you're probably just playing with the wrong group of players. Um, exactly, Dan. Exactly. Making the game fun for the GM is one of the most under-talked about and exceedingly important things for a good game. This is kind of anecdotal, but I remember one of my uh, one of my uh, early uh, one of my earliest friends. Um, he he moved down south uh, right after high school and ended up getting married kind of young, and uh, you know they they had some kids, and I I didn't I lost touch with him for a while but I, I caught up with him years later and I was asking him about things and he said that you know with the kids and the craziness and he said yeah but you know my wife and I we still make sure that our happiness and our marriage is a priority 
because we know that in the long term, what is best for our kids is that they are, you know, in a stable, functioning, loving family with two parents who, you know, are our partners and are on the same page and are in love with each other. So I think the same thing is kind of true of DMing or GMing, where if you are always putting the player's needs first, the player's needs first, the player's needs first, uh, that's great and all until the GM decides I'm done. And I don't need to tell probably any of you, whether from your own experience as a game master or from playing in a group, once the GM checks out, the days are very limited. And, you know, I know that we have a number of GMs on our Patreon who, quite frankly, aren't necessarily loving their games, but are kind of going through the motions anyways. And, you know, I know we also have some GM, you know, uh, who have recently kind of bit the bullet and said, you know what, I'm kind of, I'm going to change the game up. I'm going to go to a different system or I'm going to run, you know, something new. Um, and my group, uh, you know, I think too many GMs are afraid of their group, which is so strange to me. They feel indebted uh, to the group. Um, and at the end of the day, Princess is Salami is exactly correct. The GM is still a player. You're, you're, you, you are just as equal at that table as anybody else. You have a different role, but you are still there to, you know, play and have fun and enjoy things and be part of it. Like that is totally reasonable. Um, and I agree with Beowulf. GM burnout is 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 far too real, for sure. Um, so yeah. Um, uh, again, if anybody else has any questions, you know, we can uh, we can kind of talk about them. But um, yeah, I mean, that is. I mean, I don't want to make it. The GM is first among equals, Ben. How about that? Because you know what. Ultimately, if the GM goes out, if a player loses interest, if a player decides that they would rather be doing something else, groups can almost always survive the loss of a player um, who decides to leave the group. Or if a plot player is being problematic, it's easy to talk to them and say, hey, you need to straighten it up or you need to leave. Maybe this isn't the right group for you. But if that player is the game master, uh, you're in trouble. <laughs> um, and there's there's really no way around that. So yeah, I mean, you know, look, if a player cancels, a lot of times the game session goes on. If the GM cancels, the game session does not go on. So yeah, I mean, from that perspective, Ben, you're absolutely correct. The GM is the most important player. Um, yeah, Orpheus, I do think that GMs do feel a lot of expectations. We talked about the Matt Mercer effect on this channel before, and there's a a sense of obligation, right? Like I, I owe these players a good time, which I do not agree with. Remember, I've said this before, rather, uh, I guess it's a hot take where I said, your goal should not be to make the players have fun. Your goal, like, like think about it this way, baseball players or NBA players, their job isn't to make sure that you have fun. Their job is to play their sport and play it well and to be athletic and to be a, a, a winner. That's what makes it fun for you. Your job as a GM isn't to make sure that other people are having fun. Your job as a GM is to run a great game and to, you know, fill the characters' lives with adventure and to, uh, make the world fantastic and play to find out what happens. That experience should be fun for your player. If, if you do that and the player still isn't having fun, they're probably just playing the wrong game. You know, like there's a lot of other games out there, a lot of other RPGs. There's a lot of other games that are RPGs, um, or maybe they should just be reading a book, you know, whatever, you know, I'm not trying to gatekeep. I'm just trying to say like when GMs get obsessed with p meeting people's expectations, I think that's when you get into the biggest problems. Um, do strategy says question any advice on how to deal with sandboxes and the large difference in power per level in Pathfinder Second Edition or Fourth Edition? One level giving forty percent difference and stealth, um, all being keyed into it, seems 
hard to manage over 20. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, reasonably strat. Um, I mean, we need to think about this in terms of like the expectation. Okay. Uh, so I'll just use, I'll just use a level five, uh, party of Pathfinder two characters for PCs level five. Um, so obviously a level five monster is worth 40 XP. A level six is worth 60. A level seven is worth 80. And a level four is worth 30. And a level three is worth 20. So if I go and make a place um, that has two level six monsters in it, for this party, that would be a 120 XP fight, which would make it severe. But if they gained a level, let's say the party went to level six and they came back and fought that fight, it would be 80 XP because now they're on level, it would be moderate. And we know that the game will allow us to tackle severes with a fair degree of success. The real question is, what if we were level five and we had two level seven monsters? Well, two level seven monsters would be 160 XP, which tells us that this is extreme. Which the game says is very dangerous and deadly, but it is doesn't say it's a 0% chance. And we know that given certain characters, I mean, certain play styles, you might be able to, to, to succeed at these fairly regularly. So my suggestion is that you create uh, hooks that are probably within minus one to plus two of the party's level for Pathfinder 2. Uh, because that's going to give them a range of experiences from 60 XP lows to 160 XP extremes. And those are all technically, according to the rules of the game, still viable and possible encounters that they could technically deal with in the right situation. And obviously, if they gain a level, uh, then, you know, everything shifts down one and it becomes much more, uh, you know, much more extreme for them. Um, do I think that a uh, Pathfinder 2 party could take out two, you know, that's level five because they take out two level eights? Mm, you know, that's where I have to start saying probably not. The math is really, really working against you there. So, you know, that's just understanding your your range of creatures and levels. If you put a series of level eight challenges into your sandbox, when the party is level five, you're basically just saying, this isn't for you yet. Um, you know, this is for, this is for later. Uh, so uh, I just think you just have to just be aware of that. Um. Let's see. Um, ben says, this is how I ended up with my COC group. The GM burned out and I took over. Okay. Well, that is probably the rarest exception of all is, <laughs> is when uh, you have somebody burn out and then another player who is probably arguably the better game master takes over. So that's obviously uh, you're a very lucky situation there. But yeah. Um, um, I, I don't know that the players owe you a good time either, Beowulf, but they should certainly respect you, right? You know, the players have an agenda too. You know, we, people don't talk about that, but, um, you know, the, the the dungeon master has the agenda in, in dungeon world, uh, right? Which is uh, to, you know, fill the characters' lives with, you know, all this other stuff. But, um, you know, players, players have an agenda as well um and you know they have a they have a job to do um as well where they have to you know um portray a compelling character engage 
with the fictional world and play to find out what happens. You know, they they owe the game that much as well. Um, and, uh, you know, they have their own principles too, players do. Begin and end with the fiction. Show us, show us what is important to you. Make connections with the other characters in your party. Be bold, take risks, embrace difficulty, embrace setbacks, embrace failure. Contribute to your part of the world. Build on what others have already said. Give others a chance to shine and contribute to the conversation. Pay attention, ask questions, offer suggestions. That's what players need to do. I don't care if you know the rules, honestly. Uh, it helps. But honestly, if a person or a player at my table is doing those things, we're not going to have any problems. Um, Tiger Lemur with a question. Question, Pathfinder 2nd Edition. How do you handle the fact that the level differences could be so dramatic? How can I reuse content when I have to re-level scale everything? How can they hide from a plus 40 seek? <laughs> and Tiger Lemur says, haha, strategy got me. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, to be clear, number one, let's, let's be honest with ourselves here, okay? It's not like if you're playing, you know, first edition D&D, &D, and you've about a bunch of level one characters and they come across a group of Medusa that the group is going to, you know, ah, we can win. You know, we're going to easily win. No, they're all going to be turned to stone probably within a round or two. Um, they're all going to die. Uh, you know, if we're playing third edition D&D &D or Pathfinder one and I throw a CR five troll at a level one party, the troll, which has, you know, a freaking plus like 12 or 13 or something to attack and does Ren damage that's probably greater than most people's hit points and has regeneration and they have very few spells or abilities to even do fire or acid damage, that troll is going to just completely kill them and destroy them. So, yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't think necessarily that that is uh, a unique problem to Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Um, again, I, I think that the takeaway is that... Um, if you're using Pathfinder 2nd Edition, you just have to be aware of the fact that uh, anything that is more than uh, 100, you know, two or two or three levels above the party is essentially uh, undefeatable. I mean, a PL plus, a party level plus four monster is an extreme. And in my personal opinion, very boring to fight and deal with. But theoretically, in the math, you can beat it some a good percentage of the time just because of the way that the, the numbers work out and the action economy works out. I would try to avoid using monsters that, that were that strong. I would keep to using monsters. Like if I want to throw a monster that's meaningful at the party, uh, but it's still something that is, you know, on the scale of them, I think using a PL plus three monster uh, or a PL plus two monster, maybe a pair of PL plus two monsters. I mean, that can be very scary, but it's not like auto death. And it's not like the party has no chance of succeeding. Um, but Tiger Lemur, there is the fact that Pathfinder 2 is explicitly designed for adventure paths. I'm not saying you can't use it for sandboxes. That, for example, I think Pathfinder 1 was more designed for sandboxes but obviously people had a great time and used it for a long time to play some really incredible adventure paths. So the game system could run adventure paths, but Pathfinder two was designed to run adventure paths. So yes, there's a little bit of friction there. You are going to be working uh, against that when you are, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, going through that. Um, Shadram says extreme says something like 50, 50 chance. Someone will die. Shadram, that is what the math says. However, in my experience and in many patrons' experience who have played Pathfinder 2nd Edition, if you know what you're doing and you have a group that is playing well, uh, it is probably not 50-50. I mean, it, it's still a much higher chance of dying than you would in any other set of circumstances. So, you know, you literally do have to be on your toes. Um, but I, I, 
I, I think 50-50 is overstating it. If you have a group of characters that are, you know, if, if your group is like a, a witch, an inventor, and an oracle, you might be in trouble, right? But if you have, you know, a reasonably good party with, you know, the proper ACs and the proper potency runes and the proper striking runes and you have spells that don't suck, you have a probably, I, I'm going to say like a 80 maybe like a 70%, 75% chance of beating an extreme would be kind of where I would probably put the math. Um, so a good sandbox didn't need to be random in terms of balance. Um, no, absolutely not, Zach. In fact, um, again, uh, you know, I think that there's something to be said about that. Like, I am... 100% okay with going, you know, here is your level one starting town. And here is the, here's the nearby hills with the dungeon that is filled with level one critters. But just to the north of the hills, there is an ancient canyon in which a great evil cave layers and there's you know a level 10 monster in there now west marches does teach us that you need to give a reason why that level 10 monster doesn't just come out and kill everything um you know maybe it's sleeping maybe it's bound there right you can put dangerous things in your if you just if you just have a level one dungeon and you just suddenly put a level 10 monster in there that is totally realistic and simulationist uh, at times. But I also argue, I, I feel like that level 10 monster should have probably killed everything and that shouldn't be a level one dungeon. Then it should be a level 10 dungeon and be known for being dangerous and scary and deadly. Uh, so in a sense, it's like shame on you, GM. But um, I'm a big fan of putting what I would call locked away higher level challenges into dungeons. I remember in Dragon's Delve, there was a room on level two, which is ostensibly for level two party members. And there was like this locked vault door over here. And I don't even remember if I had a key for it, but the open lock DC was high enough that level two characters probably were, you know, not gonna pick it open, but like a level five or level six rogue could probably pick the lock. And behind it in like stasis or trap for all time was a devourer, which is a, I think it's like a CR nine undead. Obviously this thing would just instantly kill a level two party. And to be honest with you, it would probably instantly kill everything that was on the level two of this dungeon, but it didn't cause it was locked away and trapped here for whatever, for all time. But what was cool is the group remembered it. They went on and then months and months later when they were coming back through the level and they were higher level, they say, hey, remember that creepy door that we could never make our way through? Let's just go over to it. And I think they used like a high level knock spell, instantly opened it. The devourer popped out and they just completely, they embarrassed it. They killed it, you know, within a couple of seconds. And that actually wasn't anticlimactic. That, that was almost kind of like a vindication to them of how awesome they were because they realized, man, that thing really would have messed us up, you know, four or five months ago. And now look how, now look at us go, right? It was a lot of fun to see how much progress you had made. So, um, let's see. So, I mean, again, Tiger Lemur, um, you know, how does that account for a living world, though? Ancient dragons exist regardless of player levels. Obviously, you can't fight one, but you, can re you can't really run from that. Again, if you were playing a, an older version of D&D &D and you threw a great worm, ancient red worm dragon at a level five party, it would just kill them instantly. They would have no chance. They would just have no shot against it whatsoever. Um, so, you know, it, it, Aaron Smith has said that this is actually one of the reasons he likes 5th edition D&D. &D. Um, we were playing recently a 5th edition campaign. The group was low level, and I told them I'm I'm putting a red dragon on the random encounter table, and they had this uh, 
they were exploring the Caves of Chaos. We were playing B2, Keep on the Borderlands. And they had made this little fortress out of like hewn lob, uh, hewn logs in the in the woods to function as a sort of field base while they explored the Caves of Chaos. And they hired 10 men at arms from the town, uh, from the keep to come with them when they would go on a dungeon adventure, the men at arms and the sergeant would stay behind, guard the fort, guard their rear. And that way the players had a position that they could retreat to. And the one time they came back laden with gold and I said, oh, the, the dragon. Naturally, I rolled, of course, in front of the screen. I rolled like a 99 or something. In fact, actually, I think I had one of the players roll it. And I was like, oh, of course, it's the red dragon. And everyone's like, oh, I was like, oh, he he can sense the gold. You know, we're just making it up at that point. But I mean, the dice determined that the dragon was coming. And so I described the dragon just coming in and he was going to breathe fire and kill everybody. But because it was fifth edition D&D and it's flat math, uh, you know, 10 guys with longbows plus, you know, a couple like level three, four PCs, they were able to put a lot of hurt on the dragon and the dragon barely closed the distance. He got off like one breath weapon, which, you know, did kill a couple people. Um, but then he was at so low hit points, he fled. He was in single digit and he had to run away. So, you know, fifth edition D&D &D let me throw this, I don't know, CR 10 or something dragon at the group uh, and have them kind of sort of almost beat it. Um, that is not going to work in pretty much any other version of D&D. &D. Um, Uh, Dan asked Derek, "When is the last time you ran Darth a long tip twenty dollars? Just showing some love for the GM slash sandbox stream. Sweet, thank you for the tip, Darth Gorlock. Oh, appreciate the love. You know, uh, I know you are a uh, a lover of the GM streams himself. So, all right, we we got to get you on. We got to get you on the stream here, Darth. One of these days, uh, you're 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 due. You're owed." Uh, I did miss a super chat uh, from Gossamer. Uh, what makes a system good for sandboxing as opposed to a system that's good for APs? Great question. Great question. My answer would be that um, a system that the more a system cares about exact specific balance and the more that a system is finely tuned the harder time it's going to have with a sandbox. In fact, the the analogy that we started off the thing with sand being coarse and rough is kind of an interesting uh, component as opposed to rails, right? Which is like an AP. We call them railroads. We call them rails, right? Uh, uh, a system that is a very, very high performance, finely tuned engine uh, is not going to work well off road in the sand right? Uh, a Porsche or a Ferrari or whatever, some fancy sports car might be great on a nice smooth track, but it, you can't take it off-roading. Whereas a beat up old truck might not be the most high performance thing. And it might have a lot of problems with it and it might not be nice to look at, but it can handle the bumps and bruises and bouncing of being in sort of a, a rough position and a muddy spot or a sandy spot as it were for our sandbox. Um, and so you know, when a system is very finely tunedly balanced, which, you know, Pathfinder 2 is an example of a system that's very finely balanced. Fourth edition D&D is also a fairly finely tuned GM and finely balanced $35. You know, uh, More game love system. For this kind of stream. Ayo, GM Scott, along with Darth Gorlock, finishing off the, uh, the tip goal for the night. Thank you very, very much, GM Scott. Also with a nice little snipe there for the hype boss. Uh, appreciate everybody who kind of contributed to that tonight, uh, especially with the two big tips there right at the end uh, to put us uh, right there on spot. So thank you to everybody. Uh, we really, really means a lot to me when we can accomplish these goals. And you know that uh, when you guys meet these goals and show your support for these kind of streams, these are kind of streams that we're going to keep doing. Um, so thank you so much. So anyways, um, and so when I say good for sandboxing, though, um, what I mean is that you can be kind of lazy about it because I see what Brutus says here. He says, I disagree. It takes a different set of considerations from the DM and tighter systems, but you can still sandbox in them. You absolutely can. You just have to be more careful about it. That's all. You know, like everybody was saying here, if you're playing Pathfinder 2 and you throw a PL 
plus four monster at the party or play a PL plus five monster, it might kill them like nearly instantaneously, right? Whereas if you throw a higher level monster at a group of party members in say first edition D&D uh, or fifth edition D&D, you know, they probably can't win, but they also aren't gonna like instantly lose slash I have no chance whatsoever. Um, Whereas in Pathfinder 2nd Edition and to a certain degree 4th Edition D&D, you know, you, you really didn't. A great example of this is like in, in Pathfinder 1 or 3rd Edition, the Mind Flayer was like a CR7 or CR8 monster. But essentially it was just an octopus dude uh, wearing some purple robes. And I think his AC was like 17 or 16. It was very, very low. Um, it wasn't inconceivable. It didn't even have a lot of hit points either. I think Aberrations got D8s or something per per, per the, on their hit die. Like it wasn't inconceivable that like a Barbarian of like level two or three Barbarian could like chop the guy in half with a single crit. Um, you know, nowadays when you look at fourth edition or Pathfinder 2 and the monsters are designed, doesn't matter what the monster looks like. It could be a octopus dude in a purple robe, but if he's level five, his AC is going to be 26. You know, or if he's level seven, his AC is going to be 29 and he is going to be a, a impossible for anybody of level one or two or three, you know, uh, to really hit. Um, and so you do have to be more careful. Doesn't mean you can't do it. You just have to, you know, again, you could probably take your Lamborghini or Ferrari down a dusty country road, but you got to be a little bit more careful uh, than, than, than it might otherwise be uh, designed for. Um. Let's see here. So Dan was asking, when is the last time I ran a long-term sandbox campaign? Uh, Dan, the answer to that is, uh, I think, uh, I want to say it was, I don't it was during, uh, the channel was active. I'm trying to remember the exact dates of it, but um, I ran a uh, Blaze in the Dark campaign for a group of friends of mine. Um, and uh, this uh, was after, this was like during the time we were playing Rise of the Rune Lords on the channel. Um, and we ran a Blaze in the Dark campaign, which was essentially a sandbox campaign. Now again, the map for uh, this campaign was the, the map of Duskwall. Um, it wasn't an overland map. It wasn't a hex crawl map. And the, uh, the the movement and the pieces were the different factions within the city as the group and their gang tried to gain more and more of uh, the illicit and illegal drug trade as they became kind of, you know, a group of Walter Whites uh, attempting to sort of overthrow the city, uh, uh, the city's drug kingpins and become the, the, the predominant pushers in the city and the pr pr predominant manufacturers of said drugs. Um, and, but I, I, you know, again, it was an evolving sandbox where the party's actions would trigger new actions, new opportunities, new threats, new clocks, and they had to deal with that. So, uh, so probably, uh, like a year and like a year and a change year, year, year and a half ago. Um, Zach question is shaping the world as you create it to shine a light on the character's strengths or weaknesses, a good thing or something to be avoided. Zach, uh, again, the GM is allowed to ask questions. You know, that is totally fine. Um, what I will say is don't force it. Don't force the issue. Okay. Frost Jack tip $10. Just showing my support for more GM advice streams. Thank you, Frost Jack. Appreciate the support. Thank you so much for that. You're awesome. Look at us over the goal. You guys are great. Thank you so much. We'll definitely be doing more of these. You know that uh, we, you know that I love them. Um, I, I just really wish I could get to everybody's questions here. Um, so crap. What was I? I couldn't remember what I was uh, talking about. Oh, here it is. Um, let's say that I have a group uh, with a cleric in it and you know, I go, you know, I'd like to see this cleric kind of kick ass and take names. I'm curious what that would look like. I'm going to put a dungeon out there that is predominant or a, or a location uh, that is predominantly undead. 
and I'm going to let, you know, the hooks will come out. The party can do some research or investigation or some reconnoitering and they find out, oh, this ancient, uh, you know, cathedral is cursed and it's just chock full of undead, undead as far as the eye could see. And, uh, you know, the party kind of looks at the cleric and the cleric goes, all right, time to step up, you know, and they just they take all their searing lights and heals and they're doing three action heals and they're dropping massive searing lights and they're dropping uh, uh, disrupting weapon spells. And they're like, wow, this the cleric is kicking ass and taking names. And I'm like, yeah, that was pretty sweet. I enjoyed watching that, but I didn't force it. I wasn't like, I want to see this. So no matter where the party goes, they're going to fight a bunch of undead just so that I can see it. Like, that's not cool. Like, I don't want to do that, but I like giving, you know, the party, uh, showing the, showing the, one of the Dungeon World principles, right, is show the, uh, show the PCs an upside or a downside to their class. So, um, uh, let's see here. Darth says, the benefit of using random tables is that you can disclaim decision-making on this. Your random table can include threats that are much higher level, and then the party can retreat and come back and et cetera. Yes, that is, a, that is actually a good point, Darth Gorlock. That is a great advantage to using random tables is there's a little bit of like, again, one of my favorite tactics that I love to do when I'm playing a more you know, traditional sandbox where there's a little bit more wilderness encounters is I will let the party know Okay, like, you know, here, we'll, we'll use D20s instead of percentages. I like to use percentages, by the way, but, um, you know, I, I will tell the party that um, the, uh, it, the random encounter table looks like, you know, looks like this. And I'll tell them that that's the random encounter table and I'll let them know, okay, that, you know, because they're, they're from this area and they know, uh, you know, what is around. They know that, you know, some, they already know what some of the possible options are, but everybody has heard the legend, right, of the, you know, of the, of the gray rider who is said to, to roam, you know, the, uh, the 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 planes at night and like you're you know this might be what the party gets like at the beginning of the campaign and part of the fun of it by the way is like the as the party experiences and gets to explore things like they get to kind of like fill these things in and they kind of like feel like they're learning more about what the risks and the possibilities are as they're exploring the area but the other really cool thing is when the party has this OK, and, and again, they're filling it out, you know, and, uh, you know, as the party's making their way through the area, you know, maybe you make a random encounter check. This is also getting into why random encounter checks don't always have to be fights. But like, you know, maybe you roll trolls. But, you know, there's a chance that you roll and say it's not actually trolls, it's signs of trolls. And the party sees this area. There's dead animals. There's things torn all over the place. Somebody makes a survival check. Somebody makes a nature check and they realize Oh, these are trolls in the area. And you go, yeah, a den of trolls has recently moved into this area. And guess what? That is what 19 is. And like they could like fill that in on the encounter chart. And it's like they feel like they're learning the, the region and they kind of getting this inside information. Maybe they talk to a sage who tells them about, you know, beware that uh, beware the uh, beware the griffins that hunt in the higher peaks of the hills. And now you know that there's griffins. But what becomes really fun and really cool is when the group goes and they attack the goblins, they drive them out, or they turn them into allies or whatever it happens in your game, you can basically tell them, you know, as, as they do, it'd be like, hey, guys, go ahead and erase the goblin tribes because uh, you took them out or they left the area or they're allies now. And so now they're not a threat. And you're like, oh, well, what's there now? Nothing. And so now when the group is exploring an area and they roll a 10 or 11, you go, no encounter. And the group will know that that used to be goblins, but they took out the goblins. And so now there's nothing there. And it, it feels like a reward. Now, of course, one of the fun things that you can do as 
The party continues to make, uh, you know, motions and enemies as time passes, as consequences happen. Maybe the group goes into a, a, a tomb full of that horrific undead because they, you know, they have the cleric and they think we're going to kick ass and take names and maybe it doesn't go so well. And they, uh, they release an ancient vampire and then they don't kill him and they have to flee and it's really, really bad. And then the, par the party's adventuring and they roll random encounter and you roll a 10 and you go, oh yeah, by the way, it is a pack of ghouls uh, now because they took the place of the goblins, but there's ghouls there now because you guys unleashed the undead from that dungeon. And now your actions have made this area more dangerous or different. Um, and then you might even say like, yeah, the wolves, they left because they were afraid of the ghouls. They just noped the fuck out. And now it's all just, it's all just ghouls all the way down. You know, <laughs> like the whole, the whole region is, is, is infested with undead. And so that can, you know, again, that can makes it really, really interesting. Um, and I think that's part of the fun of, uh, of, of, of a sandbox game as well. Again, players like to, they like to figure shit out. You know, they like to put two and two together. They like to feel, you know, uh, fun for that. You know, I think that's really fun. Um, probably has already been mentioned asked, but how does proficiency without level change how you would approach a sandbox? Uh, yeah, I mean, it just gives you a wider range, Boothby. Proficiency without level, remember before, like I said, I would not use higher than PL plus three. With proficiency without level, you can probably safely use PL plus four, maybe even PL plus five monsters, um, and just gives you a wider range of monsters. Now, those are still gonna be tough fights, uh, but they're not mathematically certain like they would be otherwise. So that does, proficiency without level might be a good uh, option for a sandbox Pathfinder 2 game. Um, let's see. Strat says the hardest Pathfinder 2 fight they've already seen is a party beat with no deaths is 480 XP equivalents, but with bonus bullshit abilities. Yeah, which obviously, you know, wonks the math. Um, so Jonka says, I've tried proficiency without level. It allows for bigger variety, but there's less crits and crit fails. So I found it a little boring, uh, but I do think it would open up sandbox. But that's one of my, it's what honestly, Jonka, that is like my main concern or drawback with the proficiency without level is it kind of gets rid of the whole like, oh, you're higher level than them. So you crit all the time, which is fun, you know, or, oh, the monster is higher level than you. So you're going to get crit a lot. Like that is kind of what makes the game kind of interesting and exciting. And you're kind of like, eliminating that for the most part um let's see here du, 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 du. i got a lot of uh, a lot of chats uh darth when will you run a sandbox campaign on the channel well darth arguably root will be a sandbox campaign because it's obviously not following any sort of adventure path it's going to be completely emergent but in terms of like a true traditional fantasy sandbox campaign uh, you know using a, a maybe a fantasy 20 type engine or maybe not even about fantasy 20 but you know could be dungeon world or something like that uh, that's a great question uh i don't know that i know the answer to that because the realities of youtube even Critical Role is doing this, by the way, with their new Camera Obscura show, is it's really tough to keep an audience in YouTube for more than, you know, 10 or 12 or even probably six episodes. And one of the decisions that we have made is we are likely going to do shorter adventure paths um, or shorter actual plays, sorry, that other AP. Um where we're gonna do more like six session or nine session, 10 session, and then it's like, and it's over. That's that's the complete storyline. You know, trying to do a 60 plus, 70 plus session actual play is really demanding and trying on our audience as well as on us as players. Um, and there's a lot of like things to keep in the air, you know, juggling. So uh, to me, a sandbox campaign really benefits from being able to, to breathe, you know, um, and kind of, operate at its own pace, um, in my personal opinion. Um, let's see. Da -da -da. Yes, this is kind of what I was talking about. You, you got to make sure that you don't just, uh, you know, 
completely ignore, you know, oh, they took this option. So I'm going to make sure that I show them how that option sucks. Like now you're again, you're what you want to be a fan of the PCs, but you also don't want to give them a free lunch either. Um, save versus sorry, save versus I missed this. Thank you for the super chat. Sorry there, buddy. Uh, the best you can do as a GM is throw chum in the water and hope the PC swim over. You hopefully know what the players like, so it should be appropriately flavored chum. Don't force it though. And I think that's a great point save that I haven't made tonight, which is you got to listen to your party and, and players. You need to talk to your GMs like you shouldn't be keeping each other in the dark. The GM isn't honor bound to give you exactly what you want, but like if you know what your group wants to do and you know what the kind of adventures and fun that they like to have, then why, why would you try to like not give that to them? Like, why would you try to like deliberately go against it? Right. That's not to say that you can't throw them a curveball or challenge them occasionally. But the idea is that with any luck, as you get better at GMing and you know, your group better, you're going to know what is they're going to want to do. And it's still their choice and the consequences are still their consequences, but you can at least make sure that they're really compelling choices because you're going to say, Hey, I, I know you guys would want to do both of these. And so like, I think that's a really, really excellent point. So thank you so much for that. Sorry. I missed that earlier. Save versus, um, especially since it got us exactly to $50. So that's very awesome of you, uh, for, for helping us out tonight. Thank you. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Um, let's see here. Satir is going to check the VOD tomorrow. Um, uh, Brutus, uh, we were talking about the random encounter table. Absolutely. Brutus, if the goblins became friendly, now they could be an ally. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Frost Jack said the same thing. Yep. Um, you know, this is this, this idea of the random encounter tables. Why, why Aaron says you can even do like whole campaigns that come emergent from random encounter tables. That was, that was like, in our first issue of battle cry that was what that was all about um when they take out the goblins would you give them somewhat equivalent xp even if they didn't fight them uh most certainly not princess salami i would not um that is you know unfortunately one of the disadvantages to modern day style of playing um you know but uh which is to say that Back in the day, you got experience points from gaining treasure, but nowadays you get experience points from just having encounters and fighting things. And so if you don't, if the party doesn't encounter something, it's almost uh, almost like you're taking something away from them and you're not giving them something. Um, and that can feel very weird and strange. Some people actually have gotten the other way. And now that they use milestone based experience, if you're using milestone based experience and you're only going to level up after you, you know, do something uh, you know, a certain, certain thing, uh, then at least that way, the random encounters are kind of a pain in the ass. Cause you're like, well, this isn't going to help me level. Unfortunately, you know, milestone based experience in my personal opinion does not really mix well with sandboxes. Um, so that is a problem. Um, do, 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 do. I'm going to replace the turtles all the way down with ghouls all the way down. Um, yeah, Brutus. And, and I think that's what's awesome about sandbox RPGs is like the players really do feel like they're in a sandbox. And yeah, like the GM is going to create obstacles for you, but you do have that ability to shape the world. And this is something that like Aaron and I talked about many, many, many years ago. We talked about that, like for all of a character's things like that they gain, whether that's gaining levels, gaining attack role, gaining gold, Really what you're doing is gaining power to shape the world around you, to be more like the way you want reality to be. And like in, in a fantasy game, and if you're a wizard, I mean, that could literally be, I wish for reality to be differently. But at the end of the day, whether it's through the strength of your arms or the, you know, the, the, the deep, the depths of your pockets and how much gold you have, players can play a very empowered character. D20 fantasy is power fantasy for a reason. In our real life, we can't just, you know, fight our way through all of our problems. We can't, you know, we're not all billionaires who can just cash everybody out. Um, so 
you know, fantasy RPGs provide that escapism to feel powerful and to have an impact and to uh, to make to make a difference. And I think that's what a lot of people want to do. They want to make a difference. And our, you know, fantasy RPGs in particular, fantasy twenty RPGs in particular, can really make you feel like you're doing that. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Trying to see if anybody had any specific questions. Uh, <laughs> Battle cry. What is Battle cry? August twenty two. Ah. Uh, Yes, yes, yes. Um, campaigns fully emerging from random encounter tables is dope. The only way you can truly have the GM and players discover the game as it goes. And again, I, I, I think that there is fun in that. Um, I, you know, I just, uh, again, I think that there is value in having a GM who also has um, ideas and thoughts and suggestions. You know, players don't randomly decide what they're going to do and, and you you shouldn't feel like you have to either that being said it can lead to some incredible moments and so you know if i had to guess i would say like i'm probably pretty close honestly to like 50 50 in terms of just like me going you know i think the players did x i think the natural consequence of them doing x is y and then 50% of the time I go, you know, fuck it. I'm going to roll a D six and I'll look it up on a chart and we'll see what happens. Right. Um, because again, I, I think that makes it fun for me as well. Right now I have to roll with the punches as well. Um, is battle cry three out? No, the answer to battle cry three is predominantly tied to, uh, Northern reaches season two. Um, because, uh, Aaron does the editing for our battle cry magazine and, uh, while my Battle Cry article uh, was not finished um, in time, Aaron had to start working on Northern Reaches Season 2, and that was very, very, very important to us as well. A lot of people wanted to do that, so we had to make a, a we had to pick one, and we picked Northern Reaches Season 2, and that's why Battle Cry 3 has been you know, infinitely delayed for so long. August 2022. Um... John, the Appalachian says designing random encounter tables for PF2E is so hard because every encounter has to be, in my opinion, balanced as a moderate encounter for the party and thematically appropriate for the terrain. Uh, I don't know that I completely agree with that. I think the main, the main the main issue there, John, is the assumption that the party has to fight everything that they encounter. As long as you create a world where the party can potentially run away, even a very difficult encounter um, can be met with. I mean, the number of times that parties people die in rpgs because they just didn't run away because they assumed that the fight was supposed to be winnable um or maybe because it's just stubborn pride it's probably like damn near all of them um yeah gr exactly grim it doesn't have to be you just need to remind your party fleeing is not failure only death is yeah that's a great point grim exactly um yeah. Uh, John says, I mean, if you're sandboxing around in the desert and the party is level one and you just have a glutton worm on the table, uh, that just doesn't seem fun or fair. I'm not sure what level a glutton worm is, but this is also part of the reason why I don't believe in a full simulationist sandbox. I am totally OK with saying, OK, I am going to have a. Uh, you know, I'm going to have a home base and there's going to be a, there's going to be a level one to two region over here. There's going to be a level two to three region over here, right here, this tiny little region. This is going to be level six, but the party doesn't have to go to that. They can go around it and they can go to this region. And then they can go to that region. I am totally fine with gamifying it a little bit because you know what? TTRPGs are games. <laughs> I know that's shocking and stunning, but they really are. Um, so you don't have to be like, well, it's a desert. 
and a glutton worm lives in the desert. So fuck it. There's got to be a there's got to be a glutton worm there. No, you don't. Like you don't have to do that. <laughs> you really don't. I promise you. It's okay. You don't have to. Um. All right. Um. So again, I mean. It's uh, it's I'm back. I hope I didn't miss anything. Mike T, you you did miss something. Uh, unless you were here earlier, we announced that you won. <laughs> uh, we you won the 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 Ben the Ben the Ben Pathfinder Two Prize Spectacular. John, uh, <laughs> woohoo! <laughs> I'm completely shocked. Uh, so John asks, okay, I want to, uh, yes, I want to make difficulty zones, but there hasn't been much out there to guide that. Do you have a good idea on how to approach zoning the game map? Yeah, John, just use natural barriers and uh, uh, geographical features, you know, make, you know, the level one to two area, you know, that's the woodland and the level five to six area, you know, that's the, the hills. But this level six area that's right here in the middle of everything, you know, that's an ancient graveyard in the middle of the area, you know, which ancient spells contain the creatures inside of it from going far beyond the graveyard. Because otherwise, if the creatures that were here could go beyond the graveyard, this, then this wouldn't be a level two and three zone. It would be a level six zone and home would be destroyed and the level one and twos would be a level six zone. Instead, if you're going to put something like this into that space, you have to do something to sort of geographically or magically or bullshitly kind of contain it. Otherwise, it'll spill out into this. And by the way, uh, you know, I, I see people saying it's like an MMO, but also this is what um, is talked about a great deal, actually, if you go and read the Ars, the Ars um, Ludi, the Ars Lundi or whatever it is. Uh, articles about the West Marches and its creation. And he specifically talks about this idea of isolating high level challenges um, geographically or magically or whatever, because that's what makes them able to sort of be this sort of uh, pocket of danger rather than an entire region or zone of danger. Um, to be fair, by the way, yes. I mean, if all of this seems really complicated, you know, there's a reason why dungeons were f were sweet because dungeons just, you know, level one was level one and level two was level two and level three was level three and level four was level four. And the party understood that. And so when the party went, when the party went down from level one to level two, they understood it got more difficult. And when the party went down from level two to level three, they got more difficult. And if the party found a secret elevator that took them down to level four, when they were at level one, they knew, okay, well, everything there is going to be three levels higher than us. And that's probably going to be pretty freaking tough. And so dungeons accomplished this completely beautifully. And you're like, okay, well, why the level two monsters are up? Because that that's the level that they're on. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, and even if you look back at the original, if you look back at the original random encounter tables, they would talk about how your level one random encounter table would be mostly level one monsters, but it would contain a few level two monsters, almost like a, almost like a sneak preview of what was waiting for you on the next level. And so it was kind of like a, a fun way to kind of sneak preview what was going to be coming up, but it wasn't enough that it was going to be like routine and potentially deadly, right? It was beautifully designed. Rick coming in with strong $20 super chat. Thank you for that. Looking forward to Thursday stream. By the way, what Rick is talking about is Thursday. We are going to be talking. We're going to be doing a system deep dive. We're going to be talking about traveler and we are going to have Rick on the show. Rick is a, uh, uh, traveler aficionado so he is going to be able to sort of guide me um i have dabbled with the game uh for a long time but i've never really actually played it i finally got a chance to read it while i was on my cruise and so thursday i'm gonna sit down with rick we're gonna talk about traveler we're gonna talk i'm gonna give some of my thoughts and opinions and i i'm, I'm interested to get rick's feedback and we'll talk about what the system is good at and what the system is not good at and what does it do well and what does it do poorly 
you know, sort of a SWOT analysis, if you will, of Traveler. And we'll also talk about, you know, fun Traveler stories and anecdotes and just sort of talk about the system in general. But that is going to be Thursday. So um, definitely looking forward to that. And big shout out to Rick for uh, for being willing to uh, come on this thing. You know, any time, you know, I've had John on to talk about fate. I've had Ben on to talk about horror and horror RPGs. And now Rick, you know, talk about Traveler. Anytime I can have folks on to talk about these systems, um, I really appreciate it. Um, it's been, it's been nice. Um, uh, Ariel says, I would give XP for not combat resolutions. What gets rewarded gets repeated. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, whatever you want to encourage, you should reward. If that's a behavior that you want to encourage, then you should be rewarding it. A hundred percent agree. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean the, the, the secret tech, by the way, of this entire stream is that if you create a sandbox area with a town and then some dungeons and then some other cool sites that we just, you know, co colloquially call dungeons, and then the party goes into one of those dungeons, well, guess what? The dungeon is also just a sandbox. So it's... It's it's sandbox, <laughs> sandbox. So it's sandboxes all the way down because, uh, you know, even even to the point of the encounter inside the dungeon is kind of a sandbox. You know, like if you look if you talk if you look at one of our night schools where I talk about encounter design, especially like in Pathfinder two and four E and stuff like that, I talk about how the way I make an encounter is I say, all right, um, you know, I'm gonna have a roughly square shaped room and um, the party, you know, maybe there's some other exits, but I'm not really worried about that. The party is going to be entering in from the South. I'm going to put an artillery monster in each corner who are going to be able to shoot down and provide a lot of pain to the party members. And because they're artillery, they could even potentially shoot at some of the weaker members in the rear, but the party is probably gonna respond to that by sending their PCs to attack my weak, fragile artillery monsters. So I am gonna put in the middle of the room a big brute with reach and maybe like a plus grab ability because that way when people try to go past him, he can make like an attack of opportunity and maybe grab them and lock them down. And that's gonna give my artillery time to keep firing on the rogues and the wizards and the clerics and the big heavy beady fighters. Well, sure, they can get to the brute and attack the brute, but the brute has like a ton of HP. And so, and you know, in D&D, &D, as long as you have one HP, you're still at 100% effectiveness. So they're really kind of just wasting their time while the real danger is about. And I go, cool, I don't know how they're gonna beat this but I have created a potentially dangerous and deadly situation. And now I get to see how they play it out. So even the encounter becomes a, uh, a sandbox of the sort. And so, you know, if you, if you have sandbox all the way down, it becomes really, really interesting. Um, Grim asks, what is traveler for us that are uninitiated? Grim traveler is, uh, a very, very old RPG that has been through many editions. And so it has been updated many times. Um, I want to say it's like on the eighth edition. Uh, I could be wrong about that. It is a sci-fi RPG, um, which originally was released, by the way, 1977. So, um, so yeah. Um, arguably, this is like the eighth or ninth edition, um, depending on how you want to judge it. Uh, but it is, it's a hard sci-fi RPG. So it's not like star finder with, you know, kind of like zany craziness in space. It's much more like the expanse or uh Battlestar Galactica. Um, it's much more of a, you know, hard sci-fi, maybe even to a certain extent, um, uh, star Trek, right. But it's less star Wars. It's not, you know, lightsabers and force and, you know, lots of weird stuff. It's much more like um, yeah, like the expanse and Battlestar Galactica. It's much more of a hard sci-fi. Um, <laughs> will some of us be kicked 15 minutes in the stream to emulate character creation? Uh, or what is Orpheus is referring to is traveler is very famous for being able to die. Uh, your PC die in character creation. <laughs> 
<laughs> which is, uh, you know, pretty classic. Um, John watched the VOD on GNS theory. How would you bring more emulation into a sandbox style game? Uh, my answer there, John, is um, is look at look a game like Forbidden Lands from uh, Free League. Uh, what Forbidden Lands does is it does some of the sandbox experience, kind of some of the hex crawling experience. And what it does is it says, hey, you know what? You know, food and water and ammo, like these things are important to our game, but we also don't want to like fully simulate it and have to like track individual rations. And so the game uses a system of dice to represent how much of these things you have left. And every time you are called upon to use them, you have to roll it and there's a chance that the die will degrade into a lower die. And eventually it'll run out and then you'll be out of that resource. And if you find a cache of water, you know, you could refill your water all the way up to D12, but again, it'll go down again. So this to me is like a great example of sort of emulating in the case of Forbidden Lands, um, sort of the exploration, the exploration, the management of the resources while still managing to make it a little bit more gamey and not have to be like, I'm individually tracking how many ounces or gallons of water I'm tracking or carrying. So it's emulating sort of survival overland rather than fully simulating survival overland. Um, let's see here. <laughs> Everyone's talking about Traveler. Um, yeah, in the more recent versions, they have, I think, finally gotten rid of that. You can die during character creation. Uh, but yes, I, I the life path system of character creation, I think, is awesome and fun. And um, War, uh, the, the Warhammer 40k RPGs, the Dark Heresy and uh, uh, the, the, what's it called? The... Uh, I can't remember any of the other ones. Uh, Rogue Trader, Dark Heresy, uh, the Space Marine one, Angels of Death or whatever. They use kind of a life path system as well for character creation. And I think it's just awesome. I love it. I wish more RPGs did that. I think it's great. Um, yes. Uh, question. How do you make complex encounters like the example work with a random encounter table? Uh you know, great question. Um, it's a little bit involved, Zach, but um, without going too much into it. Uh, okay, Ben got it. Death Watch. Thank you, Ben. I knew they were hardcore. I knew I'd, I, I'm, I'm underselling the Space Marines because I know it's like a specific group of Space Marines, right? Like it's a, it's like the pick of the litter from various chapters to be like the, the Death Watch to be like the ultimate badasses, right? Um, so uh, how would I make... Complex encounters like the example work with random encounter tables. The answer, Zach, is I would make, you know, uh, I would make an encounter that's like, you know, if I'm in the hill lands in the map, I would make an encounter which is called like goblin ambush. And I would roughly sketch out in my notes a map and say, you know, okay, there's some elevation over here. Um, and there's some elevation over here. And I'm going to put a goblin archer up here. And I'm going to put a goblin archer up here. And I'm going to put a goblin, you know, uh, shaman uh, up here. And then I'm going to put, uh, you know, two goblins on wolves down here. And so if, you know, the, 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 the melee characters try to go up and deal with the archers on the hillside while they're fumbling with that, the wolves can sweep in and attack the, 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 the soft rear, juicy rear. But the best part about this from a 4E perspective or from a design perspective is I don't need to make these goblins, right? What I can do, this is where 4th edition really shined, is I can say, okay, we've got elevation here plus elevation. We've got elevation here plus elevation. I've got a artillery monster here i've got an artillery monster here i've got a skirmisher here i've got a skirmisher here and i have a controller here now i have this template 
and I can make this a level two encounter by making it some, you know, hilly hills and goblins, or I could make it a level 15 encounter by making these, uh, you know, floating islands in the plane of fire and the artillery monsters are, you know, um, flame spitting war cannons and the skirmishers are fire elementals and the controller is a magman, you know, a pyro priest. And like the game gives you these abilities to just slot in different monsters as long as they meet that role. And so I could use this template maybe even several times throughout the course of the campaign and the party would never even know it. Um, I'm just reusing the same template. I'm just plugging in different monsters that fill the same role, even though they're higher level. So um, that is the answer. Um, yes, Star Trek Adventure Back uh, Life Path is also pretty cool as well. Um, Rick is confirming you can still play old school rules with Mongoose second edition where you can die in uh, uh, character creation. Sweet, awesome. Um, let's see here. Da, 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 da. <laughs> the solution is to play 4E. No, that is that should not be the solution. Um, but I, I am, you know, I'm also really coming to reappreciate the monster roles from 4E. Yes, and it's not just because it made you know whatever the the job of the GM in the moment easier. It also made uh, encounter creation a lot easier. And again, I used to do this all the time. I would sit at meetings at work and I would just sketch out ideas for fights. I would go like, okay, we have a wide room and the party is going to be entering from like the South middle. And I'm going to put, you know, uh, two soldiers on the left and the right that are going to try to contain the party from breaking out. Um, and I'm going to put a, big bad uh, I'm going to put a big bad elite artillery back here just a massive damage dealer and so the party's going to want to run up right between the soldiers so I'm going to put something here like some piece of terrain that is challenging and potentially damaging so at the very least they're going to have to try to go through that maybe it'll slow them down give the soldiers time and uh, then after everybody has engaged and tried to move forward I'm going to have a lurker that's off to the side, flank in from behind and work with the soldiers to tear the party up. And it's like, I would just design this encounter. I didn't even design it for a specific group of monsters. I don't know what monsters I'm, I'm, I'm only designing the encounter based off of roles. And then I could just save this template and put it on like an index card. And then I had like a cool little box that just had all these different, um, different encounters that I could kind of spin through and use. Um, I really wish my group would have stuck with 4E instead of moving to 5E. Yeah, by the time 5E came out, we were already playing Pathfinder 1. We we had played 4E for like three, four years, and then we we went back. We, we started playing Pathfinder 1 at that point in time. So um, we were kind of off 4E after about three or about four or five years. So, um, you know, we played a couple. I think we played one more campaign after that while we were playing Pathfinder 1, uh, maybe two. But for the most part, uh, yeah, we did not stick with it all the way to 5E. Um. So yeah, anyways, uh, but see, that's it's the same idea as the sandbox. Um, uh, Orpheus says, from what I've heard from your Discord and your streams, isn't that 4E was really good designed for easily creating dynamic battles? Yes, very, very much. Uh, it's a very gamist game. It's, you know, there's no, there's no, there's no beating around the bush on that. Um, it is a game about, uh, like in some ways, like Pathfinder 2. It is a game that is trying to be balanced. It is trying to give every character a fair ability to do something and to contribute something. It's trying to somewhat limit your options, what you can do so that you can, um, you know, especially in combat, especially in combat. Um, it does. It is a little bit more loose outside of combat than people give it credit for, but it is a very high gamist score, very high G score. So that is very much the case. Um, all right. Well, we're going on 10 o'clock, so three-hour stream. So we kind of, you know, had a bunch of fun Q&A there at the end. Um, I, we'll definitely talk about sandboxes some more. Um, I want to talk. I want to talk about fronts. Um, I want to talk about Perilous Wilds, which is a fantastic resource for creating any sort of sandbox game. 
Um, and I also want to talk. I also I would love to walk through with your help, you know, maybe with, uh, you know, Bob or something like that uh, alongside me and actually just go through the process of, hey, let's as a group, let's build a very simple sandbox for a fantasy 20 style game. Um, you know, we'll start with a, a interesting hook for our world, something that makes it unique and stand out, some sort of uh, culture, environment, something about the classes and races, opposition situation, right? We'll make a home base. We'll give it some ideas of what makes it interesting, what makes it unique, what, what makes it fantastical. Um, and then we'll start populating in the map which is really going to be more like a series of interesting points that surround our home base that give the players interesting options. Then we're gonna make sure that those options have texture, that there's different ways to approach them. We'll create some fronts to represent what may happen if the party succeeds or the party fails or the party ignores uh, what is going on in the world around them. And at that point, we prep just a session or two ahead and then we put our then we see what happens we don't make anything further because we want to wait to see because we are playing to find out what happens um and uh yeah i think that'll be a fun little experience for all of us and uh you know might be a fun follow-up to the stream so all right, uh, I want to say a big shout out and thank you to the multitude of people who came out and supported us tonight. Um, special shout out to uh, our uh, 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 top tippers for the night, uh, Ben and GM Scott, who really came up and really threw a ton of support at us tonight. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, you guys are awesome. Um, and, uh, the, uh, wait, wait, hold on a sec, hold on a sec, hold on a sec. Uh, Ben, you're not a fan of point crawls? Or are you not a fan of GNS? I was about to say, Ben better may not say he's not a fan of point crawls. Um, Ben, Ben literally had this book made and then sent me some copies of it, which is a book designed that he designed and had printed <laughs> to facilitate making point crawls. <laughs> so I just want to I just want to point that out. I hopefully he, that's not what he meant by that. Um, anyways, uh, you're not a fan of point crawls. What? What? What is this? What is this? Who made this book, Ben? Who made this book? I didn't make this book. You made this book. Um, calling shenanigans on this one. Um, <laughs> that is the most, that's the most hipster thing ever, Ben. I don't really like point crawls. Here's my point crawl book. <laughs> it's literally called the point crawl book. <laughs> um, this is this is like Ben. This is like Ben who This is like Ben who doesn't like Star Wars but practices lightsaber fighting. <laughs> by the way, that's true, by the way. <laughs> so just saying. Um anyways. Yes, uh, sandboxes and dungeons are implicitly graphs. Dungeons map the graph structure to a physical structure. Point crawls are explicitly graphs and do away with the physical structure. Yes, agreed. Um, but um, yes, that is very much the case. I mean, again, you don't necessarily have to be so reductionist and take it down to like these completely, you know, reduction, reductionized gamist concepts. But at the end of the day, you know, the reason why we have all these structures and the reason why we do all this stuff is to facilitate playing the game and to you know have a experience that we can all agree is sort of you know uh, mutually beneficial so uh thanks everybody for hanging out with me tonight uh it was a long one but you know you, we had a really great conversation going i apologize if i couldn't get to everybody's uh questions but uh you know of course that's what the patreon is for uh, make sure that uh, if you're interested in joining these conversations and being part of this evolving dialogue with these really, really incredible thing, uh, uh, really, really incredible community, you check us out, patreon.com slash nights last call. 
There's a link in the description below. Uh, you could be join our discord, which, uh, is only for members of the Patreon. So, um, so yeah, we'll be back Thursday with Rick to talk about traveler. Um, we'll probably do some more pathfinder two next week. And, uh, of course, uh, our patrons got a sneak preek, uh, last this weekend with Bob's birthday of the pretty much nearly completed studio. So expect to see more, uh, night lives, uh, with, uh, with the gang, uh, sort of that podcast style where me, Bob Smith, maybe some other guests talk about subjects, talk with the chat. And of course, some actual plays, live, actual plays in person around a table. So definitely not sponsored by Dixie cups. Um, you know, I, I haven't, I only got a chance to watch maybe about five minutes. I kind of just wanted to see generally what it was like. And I was like, oh my God, it was so, I mean, obviously we were drinking, but like, I, I kind of like fast forwarded to like, I don't know, maybe like a, two hours in. And I was just like, oh my God, it is, it's so chaotic and it's so hectic. I, I'm, we, we need to make sure that the energy isn't too high. Cause we were all just laughing and, you know, just being real loud. And I mean, um, you know, when Bob would, when Bob tried to run up the guy's sword and we were just, you know, shitting on him, like it was, um, <laughs> it was glorious. You know, I mean, I mean, let's be honest with ourselves, right? It, it, it was a far cry from, you know, um, the, you know, the, the quest for the frozen flame and stuff like that, um, where, you know, we're separated by, you know, many, many miles or thousands of miles and, you know, we're all kind of a little bit more subdued. So I, I mean, for me personally, being able to be in person is just a, such a huge deal. Um, Ooh, Rick, I know you talked about it, but Rick here confirming he's going to be giving away one core rule book for Mongoose second edition traveler on Thursday. So if you're interested in learning about traveler and want a shot at winning a free copy of the rule book, check us out on Thursday. You know, uh, Rick, I will, I will match you core book for core book. Uh, I will also give away a core rule book on behalf of the Knights of the Last Call. So that's going to be two opportunities to win a core rule book for Traveler if you are interested in that game and maybe want to add another piece to your RPG collection, maybe add a little sci-fi to your uh, to your collection. So I think that'll be pretty sweet. Uh, thank you, Rick. That's very generous of you. Um, uh, let's see here. When are you not shitting on Bob when playing? That is true, Damien. It's just, you know, that's it was a little bit more loosey goosey. I mean, I can speak from experience. I think Bob is, would agree. Um, even just having the microphone right out of my, out of our faces, you know, like when Bob and I did that one stream, I think it was after the D and D movie, you know, we could barely see each other because we each had like all this microphone boom arm in our, in our way, you know, trying to, trying to see each other. Uh, so just having that out of the way, uh, I, I, I could certainly feel like for Bob, like it, it, it basically completely, you know, the only thing is I had to switch. We don't have a producer. So I had to switch the camera angles using the stream deck. So that was the only thing that was kind of keeping me, uh, you know, sort of not completely out of the way. But yeah, um, <laughs> Jim Scott, uh, I wish I could have been in that empty seat. The energy in that room was palpable. I mean, yeah, I mean, we were all, you know, we everyone came to play. Uh, Jeff, uh, you know, again, um, Jeff, Jeff is the night of the last call who could have been, um, he came, he came in and played, uh, uh, with our fifth edition group before we went to Pathfinder second edition, but couldn't, didn't, wasn't able to stick with the game. Um, so yeah, like, uh, he, he was a, he was an all-star and obviously Smith brought, you know, his class a game and his class a drinking great, uh, class a RPG and class a drinking. And then of course, uh, you know, there's always Bob good for good for the cringe and the groans. Haters gonna hate. <laughs> uh, I wish I could have been in the empty seat for cake and wings. Yeah, the wings were a lifesaver. Honestly, they were they were a lifesaver. Um, Frost Jack says your camera work was really great, given how many things you were juggling. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, don't you know? It's not for kids, Frost Jack. Let's just. I'm not trying to toot my own horn too much, but you know, a lot of people struggle to run. Dungeon World or, uh, you know, Rules Light Indie RPG, period, uh, let alone while also, you know, making sure you're cutting. But, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that, Frost Jack, because in a way, that's what you do as a GM when you're playing. And by the way, GMs do this all the time when you're not in combat. But 
you're you're in power by the apocalypse with you know people go how do you play combats when there's no uh initiative order and the answer is you just kind of cut the camera you know there are times when i am talking to a specific person and then it's like me cutting to that person there are times when i'm kind of more addressing the group it's more of a kind of a time for debate and i'll you know hit the wide shot and everybody can kind of see everybody talking um and uh in a way it it, it is very intuitive in a certain you know yeah ben yeah exactly it it's cutting live with while GMing is kind of intuitive. It's a little annoying because I have to remember to do it. Um, but like once you kind of get into it and have a good rhythm, uh, it actually becomes really easy because it's like, it's a way for me to visually kind of tell you, the audience, like this is a Bob moment, right? And it's also like a way that I'm telling the rest of the party members, like this isn't your moment. This is Bob's moment to make a cool decision or to make a big decision or to try something brave and bold and desperate. Um, and you know, there are other times where it's sort of more of a wide shot where it's like, we have time for discussion and we can weigh our options. And it's a little bit more like who wants to seize the initiative here? Um, as opposed to me deliberately going, you know, okay, Smith. Okay, Bob. So, yeah. Uh, just run four simultaneous streams, one for each camera. Well, GM Scott, I think long-term, uh, we are going to do like more like the critical role style. Well, we'll, we'll have like Derek, the GM will be right here. And then one side of the table will be here. And another side of the table will be here. I think that's the way critical role does. It's pretty much a static shot. Um, do you have a confidence monitor so that you can see what's currently live? Yeah, Ben, we have a huge 65 inch TV mounted, uh, in the wall in front of us, um, which we had the what was going out and we also had the chat. So that's how we were able to um, to see what was going on. The only problem we have is that um, when my players were talking to chat, um, you know, if I'm the player, my camera is here, but the chat is over here because it's on the wall. So it's a little bit more to the left of the camera or the right, depending on which one you are. So like a lot of times people would talk to the chat, they would talk to the TV and they would say, you know, oh no, that's a really great point. Scott, yeah, I definitely want to do that. But what they should be doing is talking to the camera. So, um, you know, it's 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 a little bit of an adjustment. Um, well, it's not as much as in your face, Bob. It's much further away. Like when we used to play at the old table, you know, audience, like your camera was pretty much like right across from you. Like you could see it staring down. Now the cameras are a good, you know, 20 feet away from you. It really, the whole studio kind of blends away. It's really, really nice. Um, Oh, you're saying do four completely separate streams. So you can just, you can just watch Bob's reaction. Like while Smith is, is role playing. <laughs> uh, Boothby, that's not, if I wanted to spend more money, Boothby, I would probably do that. I would probably actually run multiple outputs. I mean, that's what I do here, right? I have a teleprompter right here and I have a little, here we go. See, this is a, uh, this is the chat. You know, this is how I see everybody's uh, chat. And um, and then I put it into the teleprompter and that uh, I can read the chat while looking at the uh, at the at the camera. So that's how I'm able to kind of read, but also look into the camera. Um, but yeah, we, we could do that for those cameras as well. Um, but, you know, more money. <laughs> But you guys are awesome and you guys always support us. So, you know, it's uh, it's easier said. It's easier said. It actually, I'll just it. It's easier done because of, of the incredible support we get. All right. We kind of gone on long enough here. Uh, Boothby says I was kidding. Don't, don't, you can't kid around with stuff like that. I, that's just the kind of shit that we will do to make it, you know, invest. Having a monitor of over each camera is not a bad idea. It's actually a good idea. Um, but yeah. All right, everybody. Um, I will see you Thursday. I'll see you with Rick Thursday. Uh, and we will uh, see you on the Patreon Discord if you are a member or if you're signing up, which hopefully you are. Uh, again, if you have any thoughts, comments, or questions, like, make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. Otherwise, we will see you next time on Nights of Last Call. Good night, everybody. Peace.